I'm Sanjay Newton. Hi, folks. We're going to get started now. We want to have lots of time to hear from all of you. Uh, good evening, folks. I'm Sanjay Newton. I'm the chair of the MBTA Communities Working Group. Uh, I'm very pleased to have so many of you here tonight. Uh, thank you, thank you for taking the time to come out uh, tonight to hear from us, and we're looking forward to hearing also from you. Uh, at the other podium over there is Claire Ricker, the Director of Planning and Community Development, and I'm going to hand it over to her now. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And on uh, behalf of the MB, uh, MBTA Communities Working Group, I am Claire Ricker. I am the Director of Planning and Community Development. Can you all hear me? Really? I can hear, my, I can hear myself just fine. How about that? Is that better? All right. Um, I'm Claire Ricker, the Director of Planning and Community Development, and I want to welcome you all to our fourth community meeting that we have held for this important project. Um, if folks could raise their hand if they are from the Heights or West Arlington. All right, all right. How about um, folks could raise their hand if they're from, say, Arlington Center, Jason Heights. Excellent. And then how many folks are here from East Arlington? This does not surprise me. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. That's great. Um, it should not come as a surprise to anyone that Eastern Massachusetts is in a housing availability and affordability crisis that's been coming to a boil for at least the last four decades. And 50 years ago, the state produced, on average, 30,000 new units of housing a year. And housing costs were about the same as the national average. But over the past two decades, the state has produced barely half that number, while the population has increased as the fortunes of Boston have boomed. Last year, the state did even worse. New housing permits in the Boston region fell by more than 60% in April from a year earlier, year over year. So why does 3A matter? The hard reality is that we cannot make any sustained progress to help close the racial wealth gap, provide a healthy start for young children, better schools, more economic opportunities for those who have been marginalized, and strengthen communities threatened by climate change. We can't make progress on any of these issues unless and until we start providing housing that is plentiful, available, and affordable, because no child's future should be determined by their zip code. The town of Arlington is compelled by the state to respond to this urgent crisis via the MBTA community's law. Tonight is officially a meeting of the MBTA Communities Working Group, an exceptionally committed group of volunteers who have been working extraordinarily hard on this project almost every Tuesday night throughout the spring and the summer. They have taken on the task of envisioning Arlington over the next 50 years. Who works here? Who goes to school here? Who lives here? And where will they live? And so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the members of the working group, Sanjay Newton, the chair, uh, Rebecca Gruber, Laura Wiener, Shanna Corman Houston, Meta Admot, Vincent Bowden, Steve Revelak, representative from the Arlington Redevelopment Board, Kim Lau, representative from the Arlington Redevelopment Board, and Teresa Marzilli, our community outreach specialist who has been just super solid on this entire project. It has just provided endless help and support as we've moved through the process. The staff... <laughs> the staff who's made this meeting possible this evening, Marisa Lau, Talia Fox, David Morgan, John Alessi, Mary Mazinski, and Jennifer Joslyn Simitowski. Thank you. Thank you all. So where are we in this process? The timeline to adoption of our MBTA community zone. In August, we will send the draft zoning package to the state MBTA community section for pre-adoption review. This will allow the state to comment on our zoning and point out any flaws or hurdles that may lead to non-certification of the zoning prior to it going to town meeting. It's pretty great that we can get this sort of pre-adoption review from the state that lets us know if we're on the right path. In September, the ARB will hold public hearings on the proposed MBTA community zoning and other zoning amendments um, that will be on the warrant for the special town meeting to be scheduled. 
Um, in October and September, we will be drafting the fossil fuel pilot bylaw. In October, at a date to be determined, uh, special town meeting with the uh, MBTA communities uh, on the warrant for zoning adoption, again, as well as several other warrant articles um, uh, uh, proposed by the ARB. In November, we will send the pre-reviewed and adopted zoning to the state MBTA community section for compliance. The pre-reviewed zoning should move through any post-adoption review quickly. The, in, the Attorney General's Office will also need to review the zoning, but we have received assurances that should we receive this pre-review before adoption, um, we would move through compliance certification rather quickly. Um, the Attorney General's Office will also need to review. So February by February is the deadline to participate in our fossil fuel pilot. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand it off to Sanjay again. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Claire. Uh, now that we know the overall plan, let's talk about tonight's plan. You can go to the next slide there. Uh, in a moment, Matthew, our consultant from UTIL, is going to remind us about some of the requirements and technical details of the MBTA Communities Act, or Section 3A. Uh, Steve Revelak and Teresa Marzelli are going to talk about the, way, uh, the ways we've heard from the community and some of what we've heard. Uh, and then Director Ricker will come back to introduce um, this proposed zoning districts. Um, at that point, we'll take a very short break, just for a, minute, a couple minutes, uh, to uh, allow people to put their names into the box if you'd like to um, do a question or comment. Um, and that's the part I'm excited to get to uh, hearing from all of you. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, the, this process with Section 3A gives us a chance to make progress on a number of goals that are laid out in recent plans from the town of Arlington. Um, in, in particular, uh, the, the fossil participation in the fossil fuel demonstration pilot, as Claire mentioned, better access to work, uh, other destinations by using public transit. I don't need to read this whole slide to you. I, 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 you know, we have an opportunity to move the ball forward on lots of things that we care about as a town, um, and, and, and doing MBATA Communities Act is a great way to do it. Um, the working group has received a small amount of correspondence um, in our, while we've existed, which suggested we should not comply with the law. Um, our new governor has made it clear that implementing this law is important to the future of the Commonwealth, and our, a new attorney general has also made it clear that she will take action against communities who don't comply. Um, so I hope we can agree to keep tonight's conversation focused on how best to allow multifamily housing Arlington. I'm excited, as I said, I'm very excited to hear from all of you. Uh, this process gives us an opportunity to express Arlington zone, Arlington's values through zoning. This work is essential to our climate goals, our transportation goals, our economic development goals, and our goals for Arlington to be a diverse and inclusive community. Um, we, the MBTA Communities Working Group, look forward to your questions and suggestions this evening as we talk about the proposal that the Working Group has put together. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Matthew from UTO, who will walk us through some of the details of Section 3A. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, thank you, Sanjay. My name is Matthew Latell, I'm principal at UTL. We were hired through a, a grant uh, that was given out by the uh, Mass Housing Partnership. And our role has been to help the working group uh, and the planning department uh, craft a zoning district that complies with 3A. So we've been the ones who have been uh, taking the suggestions of the working group, testing them out on a map and seeing if they comply and I'm trying to understand what, what the capacity is. Um, we are in Arlington what's called an adjacent community. You don't have a, a, a train station per se and so that creates different sort of obligations for the town. Next slide. Um, many of you have been following this and uh, many of you are probably familiar with some of the mechanics of this law but I will um, provide a little bit of a, of a refresher here. Um, so the law requires that you have at least one district of a reasonable size. Um, the, the state defines that as 50 acres or one and a half percent 
of your land area, whichever is less. In this case, it's, it's one, the one and a half percent. That's how we get to a, a, a district minimum size of 32 acres. Um, the district has to have multifamily housing permitted as of right. And multifamily means um, anything with three units or more. Um, there are no age restrictions allowed. Um, you can't restrict it to seniors. Um, the housing should be suitable for uh, families with children. Um, and in that district, you need to achieve um, at least a area-wide density of 15 dwelling units per acre. Um, in Arlington, there's a sort of a second requirement, which is the state determines um, what the minimum number of units that need to be hypothetically achieved through the new zoning. Um, and it's, uh, it's either 15 dwelling units per acre times your acreage, or it's 10% it's 10 of the existing units in the town, uh, whichever is greater. And so in your case, 10% of Arlington's units gives us about uh, a little over 2,000 units. Um, and uh, you are permitted to have your district be in different subdistricts or different chunks. Um, and there are two conditions to that. At least one of your districts needs to be at least 50% of the overall acreage and uh, unit capacity. And no subdistrict can be less than five acres. And this is to ensure, uh, the state wants to ensure that there's at least one district that is a legitimate, sort of sizable, workable, uh, multifamily allowing district. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, there's a few restrictions that are important to understand. Good. Um, commercial uses are allowed, but they may not be required. For instance, there may not be a commercial use on the ground floor requirement in this district. The, the zoning needs to be set up in a way that uh, a developer can, as of right, put uh, multifamily housing. Uh, it doesn't mean that other uses can't be allowed in that district. You can allow other types of uses. It can be a mixed-use district, but so long as a developer is able to put a, a multifamily uh, development as of right, that will comply. Um, the development must be truly as of right and not uh, in need of a special permit. Um, site plan review of projects is uh, permitted uh, within reason so long as it doesn't um, become a, a sort of means of obstructing what would otherwise be an as of right project. So the town is entitled to review for things like vehicular access, architectural design, uh, screening of adjacent properties, things like that, things that can be resolved through a special permit process, but they're not meant to obstruct the permittability of, of the project. And as I mentioned before, the district can be split into, into sub-districts, uh, but you need at least one piece that's 50% of the overall, and um, again, none smaller than five acres. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the model? The model is um, a kind of mathematical model that the, that the state has given us. It's the kind of the calculator, if you will, that determines uh, what the capacity of your district is in terms of density and number of units. Um, basically, you plug in the variables, um, number of stories, setbacks, parking minimums, open space, dwelling units per acre, minimum lot size, there's a whole bunch of variables that you can put in. And um, the model references uh, geographical information systems, and it basically computes a likely uh, sort of density for that district. Um, the model is not perfect. Uh, it is not a perfect predictor of even theoretical density, but um, it's pretty close for the most part. And um, in any case, it doesn't really matter because it's that mathematical model that we use is what's needed to comply with the law. So the inputs that we put into that model um, and we submit to the state, those inputs need to be reflected in your final written zoning. 
So for instance, if you say four stories allowed here, that needs to match what goes into the model. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, there are a few uh, uh, background stuff we want to talk about. Arlington is now what we call an adjacent community. You, you do not have a train station per se, but you are next to communities that do. This has uh, made your district requirements and your capacity requirements a little bit lower, and it's given you some flexibility about where you locate your district. Um, again, the capacity is 10% um, of your total existing housing units, so that comes out to about 2,050. Um, and capacity, it's very important to understand what capacity is. Capacity is theoretical. So it's not what units are there plus other units. It is how many units would the zoning allow you if all the parcels in your district were to be vacant all of a sudden. So imagine tornado comes, there's an enormous flood, all the parcels are vacant. What, what is the total capacity that the zoning will allow you to rebuild? And this is very important to understand because um, the capacity counts that we're talking about are not uh, a plan to build more housing. They're only what zoning would allow. And the presumption is that most existing development would stay in place, um, but there would nevertheless be opportunities on vacant parcels or um, if someone decided to redevelop. But it's a very important distinction. Um, and then what we call the reasonable size criteria. Again, um, uh, uh, 50 acres is where the state starts. Um, but in our case, it's 1% uh, it's, it's or 1.5% 1 of your total land area is the assigned amount, so that's 32 acres. And um, this is a scaled map. Um, you'll see, obviously, the town of Arlington on the right, and you'll see two red boxes on the left. Um, 32 acres is the smaller of those two red boxes. Um, typically, you know, using that minimum size creates uh, a district that would have to be very, very dense in order to meet the requirements, very difficult to locate. Um, so when you choose, as Arlington has, to uh, use, a, use a larger district instead, it takes pressure off the density. So there are some municipalities that are spreading their, their multifamily district everywhere but might be limiting it to triple-deckers, for instance. Um, others are doing it in, in corridors um, at a different kind of density, but the, the size of the district is one of those variables that, again, is under discussion and needs to be complied. So far, the mapping that we have right now is extremely compliant. Next slide. Um, and it's important to think about uh, the various densities that can occur. Um, uh, Claire will speak more about the particulars of the district that's being proposed, but um, I will say that it, it contains parcels of many different sizes that would support different kinds of density. So everything from triple-deckers to fourplexes to multiplexes to what we call courtyard buildings, and these are a good example of the kinds of densities, uh, that, what those numbers represent for each of those. So, a triple-decker can be anywhere from 11 to 30 units an acre based on the size of the building and the parcel. A fourplex is very similar. Um, multiplex buildings, 5 to 16, could be anywhere from 10 to 50. Um, courtyard buildings, uh, you know, again, could be anywhere from 6 to 25. It's a function of how big the lot is, how much area might be reserved for parking, how much open space there is. Um, the next slide shows some um, probably some examples that you're maybe more familiar with. Um, the recently constructed Downing Square uh, comes out to about, the, the overall development, which is on three parcels, comes out to about 45 units an acre. Um, 438 Mass Ave, which is a, a fairly large project, 134 units. Um, that's almost 50 units per acre. 
Um, and then you have some sort of outliers, like uh, 389 Mass Ave, which is an older apartment building, and I think has a very high density, 117 units per acre. But uh, I think that's because there's very little other land on that site. I, I believe they may not even have um, off-street parking. Um, so an otherwise modest project, 29 units, traditional, um, can actually have a much higher density um, uh, than one might think, just based on how much land it sits on. So my point is, is that there's a lot of densities. Um, their, their impact, their visual impact, how they sit in the land um, can vary quite a bit, and so can the density. Uh, next slide. So a, a few examples of what neighborhood density looks like. Uh, Arlington Heights, what we've done is taken a, drawn a circle around a certain, certain areas in the town to see what the average uh, residential density is. So Arlington Heights, about 10 dwelling units an acre. Arlington Center, about uh, 11 and a half. Um, and Capitol Square, a little bit more dense, approaching something more like 15, which is um, sort of the, the, the target area that 3A wants us to get to. But these are useful for reference, again, to understand what these numbers might mean. Next slide. Oh, and um, again, I already showed you a slide, but I want to make mention that, that some of the larger existing full multifamily projects, uh, developments that are along Mass Ave, um, are in the range of sort of 50 to 100, depending, again, on how big their parcel is, um, how tall they are, how much parking they have, that sort of thing. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the, lo the location, one of the great things that Arlington has is, is uh, in many communities where there is a train station, either a commuter rail or a subway, um, those communities have to put a certain percentage of their district within proximity to those stations. Arlington has, uh, as an adjacent community, can put the district wherever uh, it chooses. And you'll see um, quite sensibly, I think, that uh, it's evolved to include the corridors of Mass Ave and Broadway where um, a lot of the existing um, uh, uh, bus transit stops are located. Um, so in, in the sort of spirit of transit-oriented development, um, that, that is where it's going. Uh, and finally, um, incentives. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, I think 3A is, it's not just a good idea, it's the law, as they say, um, but it, it comes with certain advantages. I think that, that um, have been spoken to already. Um, there's all kinds of uh, state funding programs uh, for which you will remain eligible. The state was sort of hanging these out as possible things that they might do to a community that, that chose not to comply. And then I think the big one is uh, and explains the accelerated time frame of this is to maintain sort of uh, eligibility for the, the mass fossil fuel free demonstration program. Um, and one of the prerequisites for that, again, is, is achieving a, an approved 3A um, subdistrict. So these are, these are actually tangible benefits that come in addition to the inherent benefits of maybe creating uh, a more inclusive uh, multifamily zoning. Next slide. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, the law is really based on um, uh, obligation. Um, uh, it's based a little bit in anti-discrimination law and federal fair housing. Um, I won't go into all the details here, but um, the, the, the power to create your zoning districts is actually granted to Arlington from the state. Um, and that's why the state can uh, require certain zoning changes of municipalities. Um, that's the real reason to comply. Um, and uh, it seems as time goes on that this law will have some, some real teeth. And so it's a very important obligation for the, for the town to come to um, a, a reasonable district um, uh, for, for 3A compliance. Uh, next slide. Okay. I will hand it to you. Yeah, we'll, we'll turn it over. We'll turn it over now to uh, to 
Teresa Marzelli, and yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Teresa. Uh, I am the Community Outreach and Engagement Coordinator. I sit in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division with Jill Harvey. Um, I've been assisting the, um, the department uh, with this MBTA Communities project, um, particularly around engagement. Next slide, please. So as Claire mentioned, this is our fourth community meeting. Um, we had our initial one on November 17th. Um, that was really just to introduce the community to the legislation um, and what it would mean for Arlington. We had our second on March 9th, where we did a community visioning session to get a clear sense of what goals and values the community held. Um, our third one was on June 8th, when we asked the public to help us think about the size and scale of multifamily housing. And obviously, we're here today to talk about the current proposal. Um, along with that, we've had multiple surveys that has had a lot of engagement from the community. Um, we have visioning kits and meeting in a box, so multiple ways for the community to engage. Next slide, please. So really beyond the surveys and um, the community meetings, we've tried to be out talking to people about what MBJ Communities is, what does it mean for Arlington, and particularly what do people want it to mean for Arlington. This spring and summer, um, we've done pop-ups at the Farmer's Market, the Council on Aging. We've been at Arlington Eats. Um, we've been at Town Sound sponsored events. We've been at the libraries where we've been holding office hours. And we set up a table with a guest book so that folks could interact. Um, we've had key conversations with key stakeholders and we'll continue to do that throughout the process. And then, next slide please. The, future engagement activities, and we're going to continue the rest of the summer into the fall, um, trying to engage with the whole community with the hope that this plan will be representative of the multitude of voices and perspectives that make up Arlington. So as you can see, I won't list all of them, but we'll continue to do some of what we've been doing. Farmer's Market State will be at the library. Um, you can find us at Arlington Eats. We'll be out on the street. Um, we have plans to go to the Res concert series. Um, we we'll continue to work closely with our partners at the Housing Corporation of Arlington, who have done some really incredible work um, with the folks in their community, running community meetings, um, inviting more folks into the process. And yeah, we'll be a few other things, and there's probably more that will get added to this list that isn't there now. So for me, and I think for a lot of the folks that have been involved in engagement, kind of the most significant part of the effort has been engaging with folks who have housing um, at the front of their mind. So whether that's a resident over 60 concerned about their ability to age in place in Arlington, a mom who's seeking consistency for her family, uh, service providers who work every day with people trying to find housing, a uh, young professional who may have grown up in Arlington but can't afford to live here, um, folks that currently live in multifamily housing and really want that opportunity for others, um, teachers who'd like to live in the town that they work in, government workers who would like the same, uh, high schoolers, community organizers. There's been multiple conversations that we've had and that we'll continue to have. Um, we've heard from the community about their concerns and we thank everybody for offering their perspectives on how to make sure that we maintain sustainability and wild spaces, um, what the state of the MBTA is, that's been one of my favorite conversations, um, what school capacity looks like, ensuring that the community feels whole and inclusive and represented, and how to create more vibrant commercial spaces. So I just want to thank all of you for being here tonight, for engaging in the process. I invite you to continue to engage. Um, I want to thank the working group for their incredible work to catalog all of these ideas. Um, as you could see on the previous slides, we've received thousands of responses and have had multiple, multiple conversations. So, you know, just bringing all those ideas together and making sure that it's included and represented in the zoning scenario and the proposal that we put forward. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to work with you to make this come to life. And that's 
Steve Rivalek will um, talk about our June 8th forum. Thanks. Uh, good evening, I'm Steve Rebelak. I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the recent engagement activities. Uh, two of them specifically were the, being the public forum we had on June 8th and also the survey that followed it. So, ah, good. So we, the last, our last public forum was on June 8th and it was held uh, just up the block in the community center. Um, and our goal was to, you know, kind of check in with people and show what we had done so far, but also to, you know, get residents sitting around tables, looking at maps, and, and having conversations with one another. We were also looking for some feedback on a couple of particular questions, uh, one of them being the size and scale of what kinds of multifamily building would be appropriate and where, you know, you know where they ought to go. The other question was dealt with how the MBTA community zoning should relate to our existing business districts. Um, and so responses. Um, the event was well attended. There were over 120 people who came. We went into an overflow room and even, I think, filled, oh, filled up the overflow room. So um, it was great to have everyone turn out. Um, we heard support for expanding the district. Uh, a number of, quite a few people commented that what we showed that night felt a little too concentrated and, you know, should be given a little more breathing room. There was support for having a variety of housing types, sizes and price points. And uh, we recently published a report, there's a link there. Oh, okay, well, yeah, there's, there's, there's a link there where, uh, where you can uh, download it, but basically it's got pictures of the maps and all of the comments received and all of the facilitator comments. So we're, we're trying to, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do is keep public feedback kind of very much in the center of this conversation so that, you know, residents can hear what, you know, other residents are, are saying. So although the attendance at the forum was something we were quite happy with, not everyone, you know, we realize that not everyone can come out on a week, weekday night and spend a couple of hours. So we made, uh, we created an online feedback form, which is a sim which was very similar to the material that we presented that evening, um, but just to give people an opportunity to chime in after the fact, um, you know, and you know, work this into their schedule. So we, we had the survey open from June 12th for, to July 17th, about a month. Uh, 213 people responded, uh, providing us with 550 comments or so. Um, you know, sentiments they, that were expressed, continued support for multifamily housing along corridors. Uh, a fairly significant amount of support for uh, multifamily that was six units or larger. So this is where a building of this size triggers affordability requirements. So, you know, a, a fairly amount of people seeing this uh, as a possibility to get additional affordable housing in, Ar in Arlington. And finally, uh, support for transit-oriented development. Now, we didn't just, now not everyone agreed on everything, and, you know, we're still having a conversation here. So there, one of the areas that there was, you know, significant differences of opinion was on the second question, the relationship to commercial districts. And, you know, there's essentially, you know, there is support for kind of the current proposal of puts it around the business districts, but not in them. Some folks are really happy with that. Some folks would like exactly the opposite. They'd like the stuff in the business districts and not in the neighborhoods. Um, so this is a, uh, a topic I think we're going to have a robust conversation about in the coming months. Next slide, please. All right, so some of the, our key ca takeaways from, you know, from these recent engagements and just to recap, size and scale, you know, building along corridors like Mass Ave and Broadway, six or more units in larger apartment buildings to, in order to create affordable housing and having taller buildings on the corridors that kind of step down into the neighborhood. So it's, you know, there's, there's a, a flow to it. So regarding relationship to commercial, there was support for adding housing near commercial centers so that, you know, people could act, people could 
walk to amenities, restaurants, etc., and the, these businesses would have, you know, would have people to patronize them. There was support for mixed use, mixed use generally referring to having, you know, commercial on the ground floor or two, and then apartments above that. Uh, this was both for people express support for this in the context of brand new construction, and also in the context of taking an existing, say, one-story commercial building and putting a couple of floors of housing on top of it. And again, not a clear consensus on the, the subject of in the commercial districts versus uh, the neighborhoods surrounding the commercial districts. So I am, that is uh, my update on engagement. So I am going to pass this off to Claire. Thank you. Okay, great. So here we are um, with the latest iteration of our MBTA community zoning map. And I believe we are on map number eight at this point. Um, this has been a very interesting experience doing this sort of work um, in a public uh, way. Um, it's um, obviously very transparent, um, a very authentic um, process. We have put um, most, you know, no, not most, all iterative work that we have done um, including updated maps, including maps with very slight updates um, on the website. But um, using the input we have received from the community, we started the work of mapping the goals and the priorities that we have heard um, the most, as Steve pointed out. So what we have here for our MBTA communities uh, district are two sub-districts, the Mass Ave and Broadway corridor sub-district in blue, the neighborhood multifamily sub-district in orange. The working group is proposing four stories by right across both sub-districts. What do we mean by by right? Um, we've defined it a couple times tonight, but I'm going to do it again. A zoning code or a zoning item such as MBTA community zoning uh, is considered by right if the approvals process is streamlined. Streamlined does not mean eliminated. The approvals process is still in place. Um, there is still administrative review of projects that are proposed in this zone. By right means that projects that comply with the zoning standards receive their approval without a discretionary review process. By right means you cannot say no to the use or require the use or allow the per use solely by special permit. The use is allowed by right, so housing will be allowed by right. You also cannot say no to the scale established in the zoning. The more clear our zoning code is, the more predictable our development outcomes will be. So four stories by right is what we're looking at across both of these sub-districts. Now, there is the possibility to build two additional stories on Mass Ave and on Broadway under certain conditions for a total of six stories and the possibility to build one additional story on Broadway under certain conditions. And again, these details are being worked out you know, as part of this conversation. Those conditions are, if the developer builds two floors of commercial space, starting on the street level, they will receive a bonus of two additional floors for a maximum six-story height. If the developer builds affordable housing, as defined at our zoning bylaw, in excess of our inclusionary zoning, which is 15%, they may receive a bonus of one additional floor. So some of the priorities that we have heard. Um, go ahead and change that. So as we're incorporating our priorities into this map to support transit-oriented development, what we heard, locate the zone along major bus routes. There is a desire for improved transit service and as well as a car-free experience. We focus the zone along the more transit-rich uh, areas of Arlington, especially East Arlington, which, as folks remember, initially, um, when the guidance for MBTDA communities came out, um, was really the focus subject of where this zoning would go. So we focus the zone along the more transit-rich areas of Arlington, especially in East Arlington, where there is access to the Red Line subway. And we hope that additional development along these corridors will lead to improved transit service on the bus lines as well to support more um, car-free living. Next one. 
We stayed out of commercial areas. We stayed out of industrial areas. We stayed out of historic districts. The community asked us to retain and support commercial uses, so we've excluded those properties from the zone, and we are even increasing the capacity for more commercial square footage with our commercial space bonus. This plan will increase the overall amount of taxable commercial space in Arlington. This also promotes the idea of a 15-minute town, where most amenities and services are located within a 15-minute walk, walk of someone's home. The next slide. On June 8th, we heard, what about Broadway? We had a lot of conversations about whether or not to include Broadway as part of a corridor plan, and ultimately decided on June 8th, as a result of the public meeting and as a result of the comments that we received there, yes, we should include Broadway in the plan, and so we drew a zone over Broadway. We heard, don't put all the housing, and again, we're talking about housing capacity, in the same neighborhood, so we didn't. We looked at East Arlington, we looked at Arlington Center, and we looked at the Heights as well, as places that we could upzone and potentially have um, some more robust residential development along the commercial corridors in Ireland. In Arlington. Okay. Provide a commercial bonus. Done. We did that. Uh, provide an affordability bonus. Done. The town will need to request that the state allows us to use our current inclusionary zoning definitions and percentage of 15%. The state is entertaining these requests so long as an economic feasibility study is included that shows increased affordability will not hinder overall housing development. And again, while the details have not been finalized, the working group is leaning towards a one-story bonus for affordability in excess of 15%. The last thing we heard, or at least the last thing I'll talk about tonight, is to concentrate the height on Mass Ave and Broadway, on the corridors, and feather or taper the height into the neighborhoods. So what we have proposed tonight is four to six stories on the corridors, tapering down to two and a half stories in the middle of the side streets. And now, I believe Sanjay is going to talk about our frequently asked questions. Sorry, everyone, not Sanjay. It's me. I'm Rebecca. <laughs> I was a bit surprised. So I'm <laughs> and um, in just a minute, you all are going to get to ask lots of your own questions. But we have received um, some very common questions, and we thought we could just preempt um, by giving you a few responses. So one of the common questions we received is, can our existing sewer system handle more residents? Um, yes. Um, and also to keep in mind that any population growth due to this new housing development will be gradual over years and potentially decades. Um, can our schools handle more students? Again, the answer is yes. Um, the school department has, um, um, we've consulted with them, and they have um, proposed uh, that the school enrollment is starting to peak through the elementary school system, and that in the next few years we'll see a decline in the elementary school system, and there will be um, capacity for more students. In addition, the school department gave us uh, guidance that we spread out our district to allow them to have more flexibility in adjusting elementary school boundaries. What about traffic and parking? Um, well, as has been talked about frequently tonight, the location of the districts in the, is intended to encourage development near transit and along existing or near commercial corridors with the intent of reducing reliance on cars and making cycling and walking more convenient with 15-minute neighborhood ideas. Um, and also, the working group has talked about a limitation of parking to one space um, per maximum per dwelling unit. Next slide, please. Oops. What happened to this? <laughs> That's not the right slide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what percent of new housing will be affordable? Um, 
I'm just going to briefly reiterate what Claire just said. Um, our current zoning requires 15%, and we will be asking the state to allow us to have these new districts follow that same inclusionary zone rate and the same AMI rate that we have. We've also incentivized a higher percentage of affordable dwellings. What about trees, private green space, and open space? The working group is absolutely supportive of all of that, and we are working with um, the Department of Planning and Community Development to figure out how we can have bonuses, incentives, and in general encourage the prioritization by developers for public open spaces, ways to mitigate heat islands, and increasing our tree canopy. Next slide. Anyone? <laughs> One more. One more. Okay. How do we support businesses in an increased commercial tax base? Again, uh, we've talked about this. Our proposed plan maintains all current commercial and industrial zoning. It leaves additional room around existing commercial districts to allow for future expansion. We have voted a height bonus in the Mass Ave and Broadway multifamily districts for the inclusion of ground floor commercial. And we believe that greater density near our town business districts will be a boon to existing businesses and service providers and will hopefully create opportunities for new ones. And then the last question I'm going to try to give an answer to tonight is, what does capacity mean? So capacity is a calculation that some of you have seen. It's uh, done using a, a state's compliance model. It is not a calculation of how much housing would actually be built. It is simply potential. It's a theoretical maximum. The actual number of new units built by any property owner would be affected by any practical limitations associated with the design of the housing, the livability of that housing, and the marketability of that housing. All of these questions and more are on a FAQ sheet that I think most of you picked out when you walked in, written in much nicer text than my very summary bullet points. And um, we also encourage, as we're about to do, questions. Sanjay. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to all of our presenters this evening. Thank you all to listening and, and uh, taking in all this information. I know it's a lot of information to take in. Um, so if you wish to provide questions or comments, we're going to move on to that part of the, the, the uh, evening now. If you wish to do that, please make sure you've filled out one of the slips um, that hopefully you got on the way in. If you didn't, um, you can visit the table either in the side hall or in the back. Um, and we'll now take a, a three-minute break um, so that anybody that hasn't gotten their name into the box can, can go do that. And if anybody needs to stretch their legs, they can do that. So we'll reconvene here in three minutes, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. So a lot of part of <laughs> immensely I'm we use used all um, town notices, the town website.
Okay, folks, we'll get going. We'll get going again in a minute here. So if you could find your seats again. Folks, we're going to get going in just one more minute here. So if you could find your seats. All right, folks, let's get on to the main event here. If we could get our panelists back up to the front. As soon as we have our panelists back, we're going to get started. Okay, folks, if you're holding one of our panelists hostage, if you could wrap up your conversation and let them come back to the front. Um, and if you could bring me the box of uh, slips, and if we could advance the slide one more, I'll walk us through how we're going to do this. Right there would be great. Okay, folks. So we're going to do questions and comments from all of you. We're really looking forward to hearing from everybody. Um, so just some notes about the process here. Uh, please come forward to the microphone when your name is called. And I will call both the person who we're going to speak now, and I will give a preview of who is going to be next. Um, we have all of your names here in the box here, and I'm just going to continue to pull names uh, at random, OK? Uh, that way, we don't have to pick what order to go in. Um, please ask your questions to me, and I will 
uh, you know, figure out who to direct them uh, to on the panel here. Uh, I believe everybody, no, we have not. David Morgan is the only person, I believe, who has not already introduced themselves tonight. David, can you remind me of remind us of your title? I am the Town Environmental Planner. Thank you. I didn't want to say wrong. <laughs> Um, so in order to hear from as many people as possible, we have chosen two minutes um, for people to share their comment or ask their question and, and get an answer. Um, we will, every 10 speakers or so, because of that time limit, if we've gotten some question that didn't get fully answered or something like that, um, I'll ask the panelists to see if there's some detail that needs to be filled in or some context that we, we missed because of the, the format. Um, we will, I, we're just not going to have a chance to entertain second chances to speak, um, and please do state, state your name um, and your address um, before you speak. Um, so without further ado, I will tell us uh, the first person, and then um, I did say two minutes, did I not? Two minutes. Okay, great. Um, I don't know, let's get a name. We're going to put the map up in just a second here. Okay, so the first name we have is Francis Tilney. Uh, and then after Francis, we will go to Rebecca Peterson. So, Rebecca, you're uh, on deck for afterwards. Uh, you can go, sorry, you can um, use the yellow one over there. Uh, is this coming out? No. Okay, Francis Tilney, 81 Marathon Street. My question is the most obvious one. The outside consultant mentioned the formula. What happens if you plug this map into the formula? What number do you come up with? I'm a numbers guy. I want to know the numbers. Matt, yeah. Is this, it works. Yeah. It's live. Yep. So the total acreage of the blue and the orange combined is uh, 176 acres. And the total number of units uh, is between 12,000 and 15,000. And I say it's about that amount because we're working with the state right now on there's some issues with the model and the parameters that have been set. It's usually a good predictor. So that compares with 2,000 required and you're doing 12 to 15,000? Seems kind of overkill. Uh, it's a, I, I, folks, <laughs> folks, I think let's let's keep things civilized here. And if I could ask um, Stephen, perhaps Claire might wish to say something about that. I can say something. Sure. There's when our our current zoning was adopted in 1975, and at that point in the process the then director of planning and community development, um, you know, he did two studies. One was to, like, a, a capacity calculation. Uh, Arlington had about 54,000 people at the time. And the zoning that we had pre-1975, you know, they estimated, well, you would get to about 75,000 people. For under the new zoning, which is what we have today, the estimate was for about 62,000, which is a, a, an increase of about 15%. So in the last 50, 50, 40, 48 years, we haven't had a 50, we haven't had, we have not had a 15% increase. So when we're, what we're talking about is a theoretical maximum. It would look, it's equivalent to saying that there are, you know, 8,000 single family homes in the school, in the town, so there could be you know, 40,000 kids in the school district. It's mathematically possible, but in real reality, not practical. Thanks. Uh, and Rebecca. And while Rebecca's coming up, I'll pull the next name. Uh, Lee uh, Gregoris will be after Rebecca. Um, Rebecca Peterson, 31 Florence Ave. So I had the same question as the first gentleman, and since that's been answered, I just have a couple of comments. Um, I think that I don't suggest that we don't comply with the law, but I think over-complying, like was mentioned at a previous meeting, um, is 
vastly different than complying with the law. Um, the negatives of over-complying are numerous, not limited to more traffic, um, higher school enrollment, excessively tall buildings that create permanent shade, uh, unattractive new builds with zero setbacks, loss of open space, loss of green space. I'm concerned about our small businesses. I shop in town uh, frequently, and I, I feel like these changes will really dramatically affect the look and the feel of the town. Um, I don't think they'll make Arlington a more pleasant place to live. I don't think they'll make it more affordable. Um, and I think that, it, unfortunately, it seems like the working group is pursuing other goals, which are using this law to implement massive increase in density rather than complying with the law. And these are the biggest zoning changes since, uh, I think someone said the 70s, maybe the 60s. And so I think they should really be approached with caution and in the most minimally disruptive way to our community and our quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is, let's, let's hold the applause first. Lee, Lee Gregoris, and, and I'll pull the next name. Yeah. Oh. You wrote your question on the back. Great, absolutely. That's fine. And the next person after that will be Elizabeth Carr Jones. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, number one, I've been in Arlington residence. Could you, rem could you remind uh, Hello? Her? Yes, okay. And, and remind I'm, us of your name and address, please. Okay, my name is Lee Gregoris, and I'm also speaking for my sister, who is a resident of Bates Road, 11 Bates Road. I also owned that property before she did. Uh, and um, one of my, my question, however, besides being very uh, concerned that we will, that our property will be eventually taken away from us, which has been in our home my home for 50 years um, at Bates Road. I also propose upscaling the projects, which is what they are called. I don't know what the actual name, we've always called them the projects, off Broadway with higher density multifamily units that are landscaped to enhance the lives of residents there. Uh, I'm wondering if this area has ever been adequately considered for reuse and actually rebuilding and making into a more viable place for people to live there. They've always had no landscaping. There's a lot of space there, and I think that more people in a well-planned, well-designed building uh, could, could be there. To me, this makes sense. That would bring more housing, better living for those residents. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you were wondering whether that had been considered? Uh, Claire, do you have any thoughts, or maybe you might have follow-up? I don't know. Sure, I don't, can you guys hear me? Hello? I don't have any um, particular thoughts on, on that property. That property is owned by the Housing Authority. It is a singular um, property and it is large enough to be considered on its own. Um, if the Housing Authority did have plans to build denser, bigger, um, differently, um, they have tools already in their toolbox that they can use to develop that project um, to, to, to be more dense. I think the issue um, with with that area in particular doesn't have much to do with zoning. I think, honestly, what it has to do with is, is funding for affordable housing and our, uh, and our housing authorities. And understand that should we not adopt MBTA communities, um, funding for our housing authorities has already been cut. It's been cut in Chelmsford and a few other communities, and it will be cut in Arlington as well. Uh, thank you. The next is Elizabeth Carr-Jones, and then the next name I have um, after Elizabeth is Matthew Owen. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Carr Jones. I live at 1 Lehigh Street. I'm a co chair of the Arlington Open Space Committee and a Precinct 4 team town meeting member. Tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Green Streets Arlington, a group advocating for tree canopies, healthy streetscapes, and streetscapes, and open space to be part of this plan. Um, I could talk about all of the things that we've included in our zoning and in our um, planning documents. But I think, I think tonight what I really need to say is that what's been, what's been put up here as a plan is, is very justifiable until you realize that what it means is, you know, it's so much density. I sort of feel like 
what could be salvageable about this is the areas and the, and the planning thought that went into it, but that the, the density is just too high, the setbacks are too small, the uh, amount of floors allowed in neighborhoods is too many. Um, so what I'd like to see is that the, the good thought that's gone into this and all of the hours that, that these good people have put in um, not be um, wasted by not making it really work for Arlington. So um, I guess that's it. Thanks. Thanks. So, hey guys, let's please keep it civil. Thank you. Um, Matthew Owen is next. Oh, on Hi, I'm Matthew Owen, uh, 164 Forest Street. Um, so I had a question. There was comments about sort of an economic feasibility study in terms of application of inclusionary zoning bylaw and whether it would be feasible for us to require 15% affordability. Um, and so I sort of had questions around that. Um, is that something, a decision one that would be made on the level of the town or could it be sort of based on, since we have different districts with different requirements, could those be considered individually and just sort of what work has gone into or like what do we think now how the state would react to the sort of what is currently allowed, you know, under this map or like maybe, you know, a slightly modified map. Like Claire, right, yeah. That's great, thank you for your question. MBTA communities requires uh, inclusionary zoning of 10%, which, you know, is clearly less than what Arlington is requiring in our zoning. MBTA communities um, at the state level, their section um, is willing to entertain or willing to consider um, towns, cities and towns uh, requests to apply their own pre-approved inclusionary zoning bylaws to MBTA communities. What we need to provide as a town is an economic feasibility study, that's my job, I will hire someone to do that, to prove that projects that have a 15% affordability requirement in Arlington are feasible. Projects that have a 15% affordable affordability requirement in Arlington are feasible. We have permitted several. We have permitted 40 Bs, which have a requirement of 25% affordable. Clearly, the, that level of affordability is working in Arlington. What the state wants us to do is prove it through an economic feasibility analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, and yeah, just as sort of a general comment, um, I one want to thank the working group for all of the arduous work they've done. Um, and I'd just like to say I, I am supportive of sort of the, the current sketched out um, I think the scales on Mass Ave are consistent with multifamily we've had there for in some cases a hundred years um, and the, the neighborhood scales um, I think definitely fit in with um, yeah, this, we're past, okay. past time <laughs> thank you, yep, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. sorry I couldn't quite see the talk there um, Joe Babiars is next and after Joe we will have Arthur Prokosh Thank you, Joe Babiors, uh, 59 Edgehill Road, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 15. So what happens if none of this gets built? This is all theoretical. I do support going to what the law requires, not what is over that. My constituents are concerned about not having any land, that kind of thing. but. In my part-time, I do work with contractors. Because you have the stretch code, because you have a number of requirements for um, zoning and all the rest that's coming down, the estimates are this is increasing 33% of the costs currently around. I believe that, having just redone our own home. So what happens if we comply with the law not over comply, but we end up not having people do this kind of affordability. Boston has tried to attract developers by going into office buildings saying convert them into apartments and we'll give you a 29 year tax abatement. 
what is what's going to happen if nothing really comes of this? Claire, is, is that something you could talk about? Or I don't know if Matthew or Claire. So, Claire. Sure. I'm, I'm happy to, to answer that question. Um, what if nothing comes of it? I think that is um, it's, it's, it's a valid question. Um, we don't know if a single unit is going to be built um, should we pass this. Um, none of the cities and towns that are doing this work know that a single unit is going to be built. We don't know if we are a more attractive market than Belmont. We don't know if we're a more attractive market than Newton. We simply do not know. And so what we have tried to do is to write zoning and put in incentives that will encourage development, that will encourage at least some development initially, um, on the corridors especially, um, so that we can um, increase, number one, the number of housing units that we have in town, and number two, um, our subsidized housing inventory. Uh, we continue to be um, you know, subject to 40B projects, which are large, which we don't have a lot of control over. I mean, this is really an opportunity for large projects to come through um, and be reviewed, be administratively reviewed, be commented on, um, and then be built in a way that is contextual to Arlington. Now, you're right. We don't know if a single unit could get built. And we do not know right now, I think, if the stretch code or other um, you know, policies we have in place, in place, which means they are applicable to anything that gets built at MBTA communities, um, are going to stifle development. I've heard it both ways. I've heard that it adds additional costs that makes development hard. I've heard that it adds minimal cost um, that isn't as much of a concern. Um, I, you know, again, I think this is just, you know, we have to operate here, um, you know, thinking about what the capacity is um, and what we ultimately want to see built. Let's decide what it is we want to see and then work backward from there. And then th there's all sorts of things we could do to incentivize, you know, those sorts of projects um, in addition um, to some of these incentives that we've talked about tonight. We could revisit the zoning in two years and say, hey, nothing's getting built. Is there something to look at? Should we go back and reopen these incentives to see um, if that may help spur some of this development? Thank you, Claire. Uh, Arthur Prokosh is next, and after that we will have David Osofsky. Hi there. Uh, my comment is that I support the density of this plan because I value uh, anything. Sorry, name and address, please. Of course. Arthur Krokosh, 45 Fairmont Street, uh, Precinct 4, Town Meeting Member. And uh, I'm commenting that I support the density of this plan because I value inclusivity, sustainability, and prudence. By inclusivity, I mean that having more developments that are possible with six or more units means more opportunities for the, uh, the developers to provide us with inclusive, the inclusive zoning, that is um, the units that are required for six units or more. Um, I believe that we cannot get enough uh, affordable housing without having um, private developers uh, taking advantage of this zoning bylaw, and there's practically zero opportunities for them to do this today. In terms of sustainability, numerous studies show that resource use and far too many other uh, indicators of sustainability um, are strongly correlated with density. More density means more sustainability. There is a limit. That limit is far above six stories. And prudence, this proposal, the density of this plan, will increase the tax base in such a way that is supported by, by the town facilities. For all these reasons, I support the density of this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, let's, let's not keep, no matter what, let's keep the, the applause and the jeers um, either way. Uh, so David Osofsky is next, and after that I have Julie Brazil. And if you could share your name and, and address when you get there. Uh, I'm David Osofsky. Uh, I live in uh, One Water Mill Place um, uh, in Arlington Heights. Um, I didn't know about the uh, that that we were um, uh, that we were increasing the density beyond what was required. 
uh, it concerns me a little bit, but that's uh, just an aside, just to throw my hat in that discussion. Um, but what I'm wondering is, I, so I was kind of thinking of my condo as a possible um, uh, uh, fallback if I, you know, ran out of retirement money, and I'm a little bit concerned uh, that the value of my condo will um, decrease with the um, addition of a lot more um, uh, similar kind of housing. And so I'm wondering uh, if that is, if I'm not looking at this the right way or if there's anything in the plan that uh, is being considered that might uh, uh, help, um, uh, you know, remedy that. Matthew, I don't know, is that something you can... Yeah, there's, there hasn't been a sort of financial impact analysis associated with this. Um, you know, it can go many ways. Um, more development means more value all around sometimes, right? Density brings certain benefits, amenities that make uh, certain parts of Arlington more desirable. Um, it would be impossible, though, to answer your question with any certainty without doing a, a real study. It, it is, is there any thought about doing such a study? So the question is, um, as a condo owner, will you lose value? Will your condo lose value should the building be upzoned? No, it should, would my condo lose value just because there's a lot more multi-family uh, multi uh, housing stock? Uh, to compete against it. I mean, I, I, I cannot give you a definitive answer. You know, certainly, I, if I could predict the housing market, I well, you know, may not be working here any longer. But um, <laughs> I think that it's, it's an interesting question. And I think in terms of a condo, you know, does more condos make the condos that are there less, um, um, uh, less attractive? Uh, less, um, you know, valuable. Um, I don't know. I think that, you know, obviously, you know, clearly when we put in um, brand new buildings, you know, um, they do look different, better, um, you know, whatever, as, as compared to buildings that are already there. However, I think that what a, a zone like this would do is incentivize um, condo associations, other property owners um, to, you know, upgrade their own properties and keep them in um, you know, very, very good condition. You know, as Claire, what we have is, um, you know, what we have to compare them to are the new buildings. Yeah. We're, we're, we're past time here. <laughs> sorry, I realize that the panelists can't actually see the clock. Thanks, and sorry. I apologize for that, guys. Um, thank you, David. Julie Brazil is next, and then I will pull the next name. After that, I have Mary Ellen Arano. I'm Julie Brazil. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 12. I live at 56 Coolidge Road. Um, so I like the idea of the bonuses for extra commercial space and extra affordable housing. Um, I'm not particularly concerned by the sticker shock of the, the upper limit on that capacity, but could you talk about how you got there? Because that twelve thousand is a lot bigger than two thousand. What are we getting for that? Is it is it are we going for the affordable housing? Because that's what I would hope for. If you could dig into that a little, in the iterations. Yeah, I, I can begin that answer, and, and Claire can follow up if necessary. Um, I think it was a natural evolution that there was a sort of broad consensus that people wanted the district to be spread equally throughout the corridor. And so the goal went from how do we comply to how do we actually make a district that actually makes sense. Um, 32 acres is very small. It would be a kind of very awkward, gerrymandered kind of district. And then there raises the question of who who gets that district, right? Who's, who's uh, in it, who's out of it? Um, and so the, the proposal you see is, is far in excess of, of what compliance requires, but I think it's because it's based on a, a growing consensus about creating district that really makes sense uh, in terms of occupying the corridor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we had Mary Ellen Arnau, and after that, uh, Neil Burnham. 
Hi, Mary Ellen Arano, 22. Addison. Sorry, I mispronounced it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, 22 Addison Street. Um, I'm the co-chair of the Arlington Tree Committee, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 8. Um, I'm also part of Green Streets Arlington. It's a, a group advocating for tree canopies, healthy streetscapes, and open space to be part of this MBTA uh, community's district zoning plans. Currently, I think there's some important gaps um, to the plan regarding green streets, open space, and tree canopy. First, I think we need to follow the tree warden of our town's guidance, which says 15 feet is a minimum setback to put a medium or large shade tree. Um, then I think I was encouraged to hear that the, um, um, the redevelopment board is thinking about perhaps expanding some of our current zoning. Um, there is some current zoning that's ripe um, to expand to apply to residential, multi-use, and planned unit districts. Uh, the site development standards which were added at town meeting 2020 that say plant a street tree every 25 feet uh, for business and industrial if we, ex if we expand that. Yet when there's not uh, room for a street tree um, due to two skinny tree strips or overhead wires, um, the law already provides for the provision to plant a shade tree within the setback, but yet if the setback is too small, they won't be able to fit a tree of any um, um, relative size to help with shade and climate resilience. Another current zoning to modify um, it more widely is the screening and space buffer requirement. That's in zoning section 5.3.7. That requires a screen of plantings to ma be maintained between properties. So I think getting the setback right first is really important. And I guess I ask the question is, why haven't we seen some iterations of um, of a setback that's wider in the in the um, in the um, main corridors. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you. No, we're out of time. We may come back to that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, Neil Burnham, I believe, was next. Oh. Uh, and then after that, I have Andrew Fisher. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Burnham. I'm at uh, 16 Wyman Terrace, so I'm in the Brown uh, District. And I have two questions. Um, has the working group considered, as part of this plan, the consistency of style in the development? Are we going to have one developer creating something that's all bricks, someone else creating something that's all marble? Is there going to be any kind of zoning consideration that would lend to a harmonious uh, town of Arlington in the future? So that's question number one. Uh, question number two is, uh, I am... Why don't, we do, why don't we answer that one first? Okay, then, go ahead. Does that sound good? Uh, Claire, do you want to... Sure. So, um, everything we have in place now will apply. Um, does, Can't hear you there. Can you hear me? Is this better? All right. Um, all of these projects will be subject to the residential design guidelines that were published um, in 2020. Um, these projects will also be subject to site plan review um, by the redevelopment board in their role as the planning board. So there will be an opportunity to, co to comment on architectural style, um, scale, those sorts of things. Again, what we, can't, um, uh, what we can't prohibit is the use. We can't say housing can only be done by special permit. And again, what we need to do in our zoning is make it clear what can be built in terms of height, bulk, massing, those sorts of things. In terms of style, that will still go in front of the redevelopment board for evaluation um, and you know, some comment, some um, avail uh, you know, opportunity for the public to comment on the proposed project. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, I'll be quick because uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, if you have a low house, one story, say, and someone next to you can go up to four stories in the multifamily subdistrict. They can do this by right, as I understand this. That is correct. Does that owner have any recourse to resist what's going to happen to them? But we're, we're out of we're out of time, so we may come back to that also in a in a couple minutes. Or we're, we're past time, actually. So we're going to move on to the next person, who is. Who is Andrew Fisher? Hey, 
Andrew Fisher, and then we will go to Carl Wang. Hi, <laughs> Andrew Fisher, 25 Lombard Road. Uh, you talked about um, closing the wealth gap, and the only way to close the wealth gap that I know of is home ownership. So I would uh, strongly support a two-story a two-story bonus, two-story bonus for uh, owner-occupied buildings with 15% affordable, and uh, I would acquiesce to the state's mandate of 2046, but that's it. You can, you can have your plan as it is, and when we reach 2046, just say that's it. Thank you. Th folks, I'm asking you again, please, let's refrain from the... We're on to Carl Wagner, and then after that, we'll go to Phil Goff. Thank you. Just before I start, it might be better for future speakers if you could turn off these fans since it's not hot in here. It's hard even in the first row to hear. Um, I'm Carl Wagner. I, I live on Edge Hill Road. I'm a Precinct 15 town meeting member. Um, I thank the members of the volunteer committee and the members of town officials who are, are working on this. We pretty much know, because the Attorney General said we, can't, we have to comply, that we have to, we have to do this. So if we have to do this, the best way to do it for the town would be to comply with the rules 100% to make the 2046 unit density overlays. We can always in the future make further overlays, but it's very difficult to go back once we've made overlays. I want to make a comment that yesterday at the redevelopment board, members of the working group presented probably a slightly different map but it provided for 20,804 units. And that's crazy because Arlington together right now only has 20,000 units. And the odd thing was that at the ARB, there was no talk about the fact this was 10 times compliance. It seems ridiculous to me, living in Arlington a long time, that we should inconvenience at the least the people that live in those orange and blue districts by A, not telling them about this meeting tonight, this is the, only the second in-person meeting, not flyering them like the Arlington Good Neighbor Agreement says for abutters and people affected by major changes that developers do. And most of all, it bothers me that there are such a small amount of people surveyed, 213. It bothers me that there might be 150 or 200 people here for a change that will affect possibly 3,000 units and overall the 20,000 units of our town. I would ask that the working group and the town officials uh, go to the purpose of the law. The MBTA community's density overlay is to put density where it's least likely to cause problems, by alewife, by transit hubs that are not bus stops, but are subways or railway stations. We, we you can, see that we, we there are no time. density overlays right by Alewife. Mr. It's Wagner, ridiculous. We, we get time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do Phil Goff. Hey, please stop, folks. Please stop. We'll go to Phil Goff, and then we'll take a round of um, filling in some of the blanks that we had earlier. Thank you, Phil Goff, uh, 94 Grafton Street, um, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 7. And my house, I think it maybe is right on the edge of the 350 uh, mark, depending on if it's the center line of Broadway or the edge of Broadway, whatever. Um, but I think whether I'm, you know, whether my house is within that orange zone or outside of the orange zone, you know, clearly this will have some impact potentially on me and my neighbors. But, you know, four-story buildings, they don't scare me. Like, obviously, I think some people here are a little scared of them. Um, I don't mind some additional density. I recognize that you know a lot of the two-family houses, say on my street and many others in East Arlington and throughout town, even with the change in zoning with the additional density, most of those two-family houses, they're not going anywhere for the most part. I mean, I'd like to think that with this change zoning, you know, two-family houses, when you know some of them maybe are kind of falling apart, maybe there is a consolidation of some properties. I'd much rather see you know, a four-story apartment building on some of the um, some of the parcels in East Arlington and elsewhere where more recently, you know, redevelopment has meant just McMansions, you know, two-family McMansions. There's a big one on Winter Street. There's one on Marathon and, and uh, Waldo Street. 
if we had zoning like this, you know, those sites should have been four units of housing, five, maybe six units of housing, but instead you get a two-family McMansion. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits here. I think that the working group has done a good job and I generally support um, support the, the strategies here. Um, I do agree to some degree uh, with the previous speaker, it would be nice to see some of that density, some of the four-story density closer to Alewife Station. I know there's flood zone issues that, that I think that could be perhaps overcome uh, in design, um, you know, with good architecture. Uh, but I'd like to see perhaps some of that reconsidered. But, you know, I'm happy to see four-story buildings, five and six-story on Mass Ave and Broadway. And oh, oh, um, let's move forward. We're past time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. We're, oh, yes. We're going to return to um, any questions that we didn't get answers to. Um, Claire, did you want to address from earlier? Sure. So the question was, um, what happens if someone's neighbor sells their house and someone builds a four-story building on it and the house next door is a single-floor house? What happens when that person sells their house? What happens when that person sells their house? It's an opportunity for more people to buy homes in Arlington and to participate in Arlington. I mean, we, we go from having one house with, a, with a, a wonderful family in it, and maybe they've lived their, their lives in Arlington, and maybe the older folks want to stay in Arlington, and the way that they can do it is to redevelop their property. Um, this is uh, just, you know, an, an opportunity, really, um, for property owners, um, ultimately, when they choose to um, vacate their property, to um, exact not just the value of what they have, but the value of the potential capacity um, that has been zoned over their home. And really what it results in is more housing, more people, more opportunity, really, in Arlington. Was there another question that we didn't get to earlier? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Um, the next person I have is Shelly Dean. And, and after Shelly, we'll have Annie LaCourt. My name is Shelley Dean. I live at 7 Cleveland Street, and I'm actually um, in East Arlington in one of the orange uh, sections. Um, I want to talk and, and also say that I'm very supportive of this plan. Um, I too am not scared about height. I'm not scared about density. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, um, what I was going to say, or what I had said, is that I'm not scared about height. Um, I don't think four stories is crazy. Most of the uh, buildings in my neighborhood are three-story buildings, so four stories isn't outrageous to me. Um, and I'm really um, uh, very pleased to see the sustainability that will come with density. I think that's really important um, for our town, and I think it's really important for our future. Um, I guess the question that I have is really a, a question, which is there are a number of properties that are excluded, um, either because they're in commercial districts or because they're part of the Arlington Heights um, uh, study. And I'd just like a little clarification about why those properties are excluded and, and what, the, um, uh, what their zoning currently will allow. Um, I would hope that they would allow density as well. Yes, Steve, maybe you could answer some of that, and then we'll go to Claire. Yes, maybe I'll Steve. start with the Arlington Heights Business District first. So the Arlington Heights Business District is currently sort of a, a patchwork quilt of small districts that are sewn together. Um, you know, from parcel to parcel, the regulations change because the districts change. So earlier in the year, the redevelopment board started working on a plan to basically redo the zoning uh, based on, you know, some, some planning that had happened earlier. And Steve, you're going to have to go quick. Okay. So, so basically, uh, we, there are plans to redo the business districts in Arlington to make, give them a, a little more density and then eventually look to look at the other uh, business districts. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Annie Laporte and then... Uh, Phelan. Annie Laporte, 48 Chatham Street, town meeting member from Precinct 13. Um, so I got a couple of really quick hits here. 
This zone, as represented on this current map, is 176 acres. What percentage of the land area of Arlington is that approximately? How quick can you do mental math? I can tell you in a second. I got, I got some math to do, though. I'll, I'll okay. end about I'll, five. I'll tack up the second question while you guys are coming up with that. Um, so, if I understand correctly, the state will only allow us, if they don't agree to our 15%, They'll only allow us 10% inside of the MBTA Communities District, but that doesn't affect our inclusionary zoning in the rest of the town, correct? Correct. Okay, so it's only within that 176 acres, which is what percentage of the town? About 5 or 6%. So it's 5 or 6% of the town where our, our inclusionary zoning would change. And if I understand the map correctly, we are abutting some of the commercial and industrial districts, but we're not intruding on any of them, and we are not giving up any current public open space. Correct. Great. Thank you very much. So, in my last 43 seconds, I'm going to say that I'm fully in support of this plan. We have a climate crisis and a housing crisis, and more density in Arlington is part of the solution to both. If we don't build here, then there will be more open space filled with housing further to the west of us, the south of us, the north of us. And all of that will be inconvenient to public transportation and will require personal vehicles for people to get to their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And we have an affordability crisis, and the housing here is where people need the housing. It's near to the jobs that they already have, and it's in a community with good schools so on and so forth. It's very important that we do this, and most important, it's we're, that we we're time, not do the minimum, but that we do we're, what's right. We're time. Okay, Sandra. Yep. Uh, Michelle Phelan is next, and then Jennifer Seuss. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Phelan. I live in District 4 and I'm a town meeting member. First, I want to thank everybody for all the amazing work you've done. I've been following the iteration of the plans over time, and it's really a Herculean task. So thank you so much for all the dedication and all the hard work. I just want to comment that the version of the plan just before this one had a two-tier two idea. The blue would have been five-story, and the orange would have been three-story. And that kind of gave me a little bit of relief, thinking that if you approach um, East Arlington from Route 16, Seeing three-story buildings on either side of the road would feel kind of comfortable. However, when you switch to making those orange structures four stories and then say, guess what, you get an extra two stories if you comply with these certain requirements you talked about during the conversation. Now you're talking about driving down Mass Ave in East Arlington, heading toward the center on both sides of the street, a potential, and I realize it's not all filled in, of six stories on both sides of the street. All I can think of is Central Square. What I want to ask the committee to think about is setbacks and how important setbacks are. Ten feet is not very far. Ten feet might be a combination of these two tables together. To have a, a, a building, a six-story building, that close to the perimeter of Mass Ave, I think is going to feel very tight. And I, somebody mentioned tree canopies earlier, which I think is another very important factor. If you've got a 10-foot setback, you really can't have increase your tree canopy. So I'm just asking the committee to think carefully about urbanization, which is good, density, which is good, but also green and, and um, open relief, air relief, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go next to Jennifer Seuss and then Bill Fuchs. Hi, uh, Jennifer Seuss, uh, Tammy member, uh, 45 Teal Street. Um, I am very excited about this proposal. I see this proposal as re-legalizing the type of modest housing choices that we used to build in Arlington. If you think of the kinds of buildings that will now be allowed, they are very much built like the buildings that are already part of the fabric of our community, but that in 1975, we made it illegal to build in Arlington. So I am really excited about this. Um, I am not scared about the capacity. If you remember at town meeting, for those who were there, when we had the debate about for, um, accessory dwelling units, there's a lot of worry that we'd see thousands of accessory dwelling units popping up. 
and I think we've had four or five permitted. So capacity is not quite, I, I've heard four, but capacity is not quite the same thing as what will be built and what will be built of immediately, right? So this is a very conservative, modest proposal that will increase housing very slowly over time um, in the places that they need to be. Um, I have one quick question. I am, I, I love the reduction setback. One of my big bugaboos is the very large setbacks that are required don't fit East Arlington. Um, but I'm wondering if you add ground for a commercial, if you consider reducing that setback. Because right now, when we have ground for a commercial, we don't have a huge setback. That, so that you can walk by, and you can look in the windows, and you can see the see different things. Um, and just, I, I just, I'm curious if that was maybe being considered, or I'd like to advocate for it. Sure, that one's that one's easy. Actually, yes, we had um, talked a lot about. Uh, a setback uh, required for a residential only building on Mass Ave and Broadway, um, but that a zero setback would be required for street level commercial. Excellent, thank you. Um, Bill Fuchs is next, and then I'm gonna see if this person can uh, knows it's them. I just have a first name with Gina, but it does say Bates Road. Does somebody, they know, okay, they know who they are. Okay, great, we'll see them next. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Fuchs on 7th Cleveland Street, so I'm right in the neighborhood multifamily subdistrict. You gotta get a mic, man. Gotta add, uh, that sounds better. A um, couple of sentences, Bill Fuchs, 7 Cleveland Street, right in the multifamily district. Um, I would actually support um, the expansion of this into commercial districts with the requirement that um, the ground floor commercial be preserved. Um, I think that um, I'm curious about why the West End of Mass Ave, the, um, which is labeled as the ARB Arlington High Tree Zoning Study Area, hasn't been included um, in one of these districts. Um, should we get an answer? Should we get an answer to that question? Um, either Steve or Claire, do you want to answer that? Do you want to answer? Oh, what? You, you take it. Sure. I'm happy to answer that question. Um, we were asked by the redevelopment board in one of our working sessions to please exclude the study area that they would like to um, take a look at. Uh, it will be a warrant, it will be on the warrant, warrant article for the fall town meeting to establish a singular business zone across Arlington Heights, which was a recommendation of the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan that was done a few years ago. Thank you. Um, I think that this, this is a great program. I think that it's going to have little or no impact to public open space um, and will really have limited functional impact on private property open space. Um, I'm excited that this proposal so strongly supports the goals described in existing town plans, um, including diversity, affordable housing, and supporting local businesses. Um, I think that this is the right size plan for the um, the town. Thank you, Bill. And then uh, Gina. And then after that, um, well, actually, I realized we had one other question that we didn't, I think, answer, um, which we'll come back to. Hi, I'm Gina Gregoris. I'm at 11 Bates Road. My sister has already spoken. First of all, I want to say I do support the, the, the complying with the law, of course. We have to do that. That's fine. But I do think that this is really overkill. When I look at this map, a uh, lot of orange, especially on my street, it seems to me, and I'd like to have an answer to this, is the ultimate goal to take a street like Bates Road, and, and which is made of single-family housing, is the ultimate goal then to rid the town of single-family housing, or at least in East Arlington. Uh, my second question is, is Look, should we what get is, an answer to that? No, let me, let me okay. say my second question. Um, and the second question is, is how... What is the town doing to protect homeowners and taxpayers from predatory and aggressive developers? Because this does seem to be like a real good program for them, but not necessarily for the rest of us. So, so folks, let's, let's hold the applause, please. I really would appreciate if you did not applaud. Steve, could you answer the first question? So no, this is not a plan to rid the town of single family homes. So this will likely be implemented as an overlay district. So a person who wants to develop a property can choose to, you know, use these set of regulations or the existing one family regulations. Ultimately, if a person wants to build a single family home, yes, that will be an allowed use in this district. Um, and then Claire, did you want to answer the, the second question? 
Sure. So the second question is, what is the town doing to protect homeowners and taxpayers from predatory developers? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, what I'm, what I can say is, is that we go through several level, le, several levels of project review with ample opportunity for the public to comment. Developers come in front of the ARB oftentimes for three to four meetings for small projects. Um, and by a small project, I mean maybe one floor commercial, eight units above, something like that. Um, oftentimes uh, leads to uh, several, several meetings with several opportunities um, for public comment. I think that there is nothing that gets built in Arlington by right or not um, that doesn't have an opportunity for the public to weigh in and for abutters to be notified. Now, there we're, is... Oh, we're a bit past time. <laughs> if, if, if you could... Um, let's return. We, I think we had a question earlier from Eric, Mary Ellen about uh, that, we didn't, that we didn't return to um, about setback, wasn't it? Do you... I can answer, it? yeah. So... A number of map iterations ago, we ran a model with 20-foot setback, so we're probably talking map five <laughs> at this point. And I, that was discussed by the working group. The model numbers came out pretty similar to what we're looking at, but there were some differences. Matthew can probably speak to those figures better than I can. But ultimately, the working group decided on the 10-foot setbacks in order to encourage commercial development and for the fact that in the neighborhood districts, when you take the average of existing setbacks, it comes out closer to 10 than it does to 20. So it was more to keep in the form of the neighborhoods that that decision was made to, use, to recommend a 10-foot setback. So I hope that is clarifying. Elaborate if not. Thanks. Uh, I have Austin Brown next, and then I'll find another name. After uh, Austin Brown is Gene F. is what I have. Austin, you can uh, the podium over there. Name and, and address, please. Gene F., do you know who you are? Okay, great. All right, hello, my name is Austin Brown and I live at 10 Belknap Street. Uh, I'd like to tell you all a little bit about the development that's going on at Belknap Street. So I believe that Massachusetts as a whole has a problem with shoddy buildings and no accountability because when people buy a house these days, a lot of people do it with waived inspections. So there's no accountability for the builders. Anyways, so let me tell you what's happening on Belknap Street. So, sorry, let me catch my breath, the big crowd. All right, um, we had two four-unit townhouses put in, so a total of eight units. So on the first unit, they built it, the people moved in, uh, they sold it for about a million bucks a unit. Um, after a year or two, they found out that the builders had put out bump outs with no foundation underneath. They just like had put cement blocks on and then built up two and a half stories. Um, so obviously that structure was not, not safe. Um, currently that's half unoccupied. The same builders put in uh, another structure across the street, which was again, two four unit town, or just uh, a four unit structure. Um, that, they had to go in front of the Arlington Redevelopment Board because it turns out it violated a whole bunch of the zoning laws and the building code as well. Anyways, both these structures are not caught at all in the building process. So as far as I'm concerned, even with the existing uh, zoning laws, there's not enough oversight. So you're proposing a whole bunch of new development um, I'm really not comfortable with this unless you propose a huge amount of increase in the oversight that has to be placed on new developers. As somebody said before, these new developers are extremely predatory. They'll do anything to maximize profits, obviously. So anyways, I think if you're proposing something like this, you really need to have a lot more oversight against predatory developers. Thank you. Um, Gene F, please. Gene F. And then after that, we'll go to Winnell Evans. Hi, I'm Jean. I live on 230. Oh. Hi, I'm Jean. I live at 230 Mass Ave in East Arlington. And as an engineer, I don't agree with one of the big assumptions that you made. Um, 
which is that you put the corridor along East Arlington because you have access to the red line. Well, as a commuter on the 77 bus, the 77 bus is extremely unreliable. Sometimes people hitch a ride on the 350 bus that goes to the uh, um, goes to Alewife instead of the 77. A lot of people get off at quarter. Um, even though this is supposed to be every 12 minutes, it is not. In fact, one person I talked to this week said they had waited 40 minutes and then they called an Uber and it cost them over $50. And um, and what we need to realize is that there's the better bus project the MBTA is um, doing, which is going to change the service of the 350 bus. The 350 bus is no longer going to go from Burlington all the way to Alewife going through East Arlington through Mass Ave. It's going to go to Arlington Center and then to Davis. But what I think, which I'm still working with Sean Garbley, you know, I've been in contact with him with the Better Bus Project, is that the Turkey Hill bus is going is not going to go down um, Pleasant Road to Alewife. It's going to go through. It's going to be the, the substitute. But the Turkey Hill bus right now, the 67, has much less service than the 350 bus. It's so I don't believe commuters will are going to have that option of getting on the 350 bus to get access to the red line. And right now, it's so poor. I mean, I personally am affected. I, it's not reliable. When there's, when there's green line, there's all these problems with the MBTA right now. When there's a green line... Um, if, if you could you wrap know, up, we've... You, what? If you could wrap up, you've hit the, okay, the two shuttle. minutes. Okay, So what I'm saying is the MBTA bu um, bus is, is poor. And I believe that by concentrating it onto the Mass Ave, you know, the, the assumption is wrong. And I'm, I'm trying to work with Sean Garbley. I'm trying to get it, the 350 bus, you know, access to the... Uh, Th thank you. Thank you. I, I, think I, think we... I did have another question about LITC. Is the affordable housing... You know, we, 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 no? we've, we've hit our amount of time, folks. Let, let's, we might be able to answer after. Um, the next name I have is Winnell Evans. And then after that, I have uh, Chris Helleter. And I wasn't sure... Chris, did you want us to bring a microphone to you, or did you want to come up to the front? It was unclear um, from the... Chris, are you... Chris Helleter. Helleter. H-E-L-E-T-E-R. Okay, I guess we'll, we'll pass on that one. No, it's not Chris Soretti. It's not Chris Soretti. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll pull another one while Winnell's talking. Sorry. Thank you. Winnell Evans, um, 20 Orchard Place. I'm a town meeting member with Precinct 14. My thanks to the working group. I've attended many meetings, and I know the, the hours and the effort and the thought that has gone into this, and I'm very grateful for their work. Um, however, I have a slightly contrarian view about this. I think this is likely to happen quite a bit faster than people are saying. I don't think we're looking at a 50-year gradual slow time span. I think that the financial incentives for current owners and for developers are so attractive that we are likely to see an explosion in development. I am frequently driving through Alston and Brighton and Watertown. And the transformation that has happened in these areas over the past five years is staggering. And they are five and six story buildings with no setbacks on main streets. Uh, we are talking about transforming Arlington into a city. And if we do that, then I think we've got to let the wonderful Jim Feeney and our select board go and think about hiring a mayor because we're not going to be a town anymore. Um, and my question is, I'm very curious about the, um, the capacity modeling that our wonderful consultant, Util, has been doing. And I would like to request that the, the sheets that they have produced and the data inputs that they have used be made available to the public, either on the MBTA uh, website or some other place on the town website, so that residents have access to this. Thank you all very much. Thank you. 
Uh, the next I have Mark Rosenthal, and then after that we'll go to J.P. Lewicki. And if Chris Helleter, if you are still here, you can let wave a hand and we'll figure it out. Mark Rosenthal, 62 Walnut Street, and town meeting member from Precinct 14. Um, the uh, util representative, I'm sorry, I forget your name, um, told us that uh, this plan provides for 12,000 to 15,000 units as compared to the uh, 2046 units required by the state. Um, now, I would like to request, and I want to make this clear, I'm not looking for somebody to make a guess and uh, redirect the question to uh, a question I'm not asking. I would like to request, I don't know if I have the right to do this, but I would like to request that you two do a study and tell us what the uh, projected number of additional residents in town, are, in town would be for the 12,000 to 15,000 plan that we're seeing now, ideally also for the over 20,000 plan that I just learned about tonight. And um, if I don't have the right to do that, I would like to request to the uh, working group that uh, presumably they have the right to do that, that they uh, request this, re you know, tell the util to do this study, uh, do a study of, to project not only how many additional residents, but how many additional students, what the additional load is going to be on our schools, not just for this year or next year, but over, but year by year, at least over the next two decades, so that we know what we're committing to. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Oh, we're, we're out of time. We'll maybe circle back to see if we have any answers to, to that question later. Um, next, I had uh, JP Lewicki, and after that is Carol Bond. Hi, uh, JP Lewicki, 104 Bay State Road. Um, I also want to thank the working group for all the hard work they've done. There's been a lot of really thoughtful decisions that went into it. Into it. Um, a lot of times I've kind of seen what they've put out and agreed that like it's kind of very important to do that. Um, given the question that's been raised about kind of why are we doing all of this extra capacity, if we don't actually, so it's kind of, if we look at what will happen if we don't add those potentially uh, 10,000 housing units here, those instead, instead of being on existing developed sites in a walkable community where people won't have to take cars, can use public transit, 10,000 housing units elsewhere, that's potentially 10 or 20,000 acres of land. It's people uh, who have two or three cars for their household, uh, driving 30 or 40 miles for the commute. Um, in terms of what it means for our community, it means your children uh, kind of worrying, are they actually gonna be able to afford to live where I live now? Um, if I want to move to a smaller place, will there be uh, a variety of housing types for that? Uh, and it also just means uh, we're not really going to be stepping up to actually take a effective role in addressing climate problems. Uh, so again, thanks to the working group. Really appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. I have Carol Band next, and then Stephen Malone. Hi, Carol Band. I'm a uh, town meeting member from Precinct 8. I live on Bartlett Avenue, which is in the orange section. I think what people are concerned about, and I know I am, is that we're worried that we're going to get a town that's stuffed with the development that's next to Stop and Shop. That's the poster child of bad development. And how are we going to protect that? What sort of, there was no review for that building, which is pretty ugly, and I don't know that there's going to be oversight enough to protect future development 
also the did, one. Did you did you want an answer to that question or? Yeah, but can I ask my other question sure. also? Um, the maximum of one parking space per unit is is admirable, I think, and, and we do want to become less dependent on automobiles, but we don't have a public transportation system that promotes that or that is workable. And so people are going to drive and they're going to park on the streets and the character of the town is going to change. Um, so you can, yeah, answer my first question, that'd be great. Sure. So the question was, the building next to Stop and Shop, is that 882 Mass Ave? Right. <laughs> so that, that was a building that was um, put through uh, several public meetings, uh, public hearing um, in front of the ARB. It went at least one night or more. Um, honestly, you know, to, to be fair, you would have had to be looking for it to know that there were public meetings related to it. But there were hel they were held. Um, in terms of what we can do about, you know, um, that sort of development, preventing, you know, promoting whatever it is, um, however you feel about that building, you know, I would encourage folks to keep an eye on the ARB agenda. Um, you know, the plans, the specs, the renderings are all up there, um, available for anyone's perusal. Uh, so we have Stephen Maloon, and then on to Marion King after that. Oh, wait, I don't see Steve. Stephen Maloon, Marion King. I don't see Stephen Maloon, so maybe Marion King. Stephen and I both put name in questions. And, name and, Stephen name and address. Maloon, 7 Webster Street, Arlington. Pardon? Stephen Maloon, 7 oh. Webster Street, Arlington. We are not in agreement with this proposal. We don't think it should be beyond what the state requires for a lot of reasons that have been expressed tonight. But most importantly, what bothers us is that we do not feel this is communicated effectively to all of the residents of Arlington, nor was the survey solicited to all of the residents of Arlington to get feedback so that this committee, who's done a lot of hard work, and I do appreciate that, could weigh in. Small group of people, small group of people uh, surveyed. This is not representative of this community at all. And that is a great disappointment. I know you've done a lot of hard work, but in this regard, you have not sought input from the majority even of the residents in Arlington. I've lived in this, my family has been in this community since 75. People on my street are two and three generations. None of them are here tonight probably because they don't know about it. There you go. So I would say you need to get this information out. You need to survey the whole town with an objective survey, not a slanted survey that gives all the information and lets the residents give you their feedback. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We have Marion King next. Um, and I will note it is 9 o'clock. Um, we are here to hear from you, and so we will, we will keep going um, for anybody who wishes to stay. Um, Marion King, and then, uh, oh, oh, I think G we already heard from Gina earlier, so I'll pull another one while Marion's talking. Marion King, I'm a town meeting, Precinct 1, and um, 122 De Decatur Street. I'm also a past um, tenant leader at Nanami Manor Tenants, which was a family public housing in Arlington. Uh, I do want to comment also on the uh, bus service on Broadway. Um, for people who do need bus service, that bus route does not run into Arlington on Sundays. So that's very problematic for low income and other persons who need to use public transit. Many of our bus routes do not run regularly at times when residents need them as was already spoken about regarding even the 77. 
and it is getting more difficult to get to the red line. We don't have good service to the green line. All right. Um, while we are required to provide more housing, which I agree with, there seems to be no requirement for the MBTA to provide greater service to us to enable us to have less individual household usage of vehicles. There also does not seem to be written into the zoning requirements um, a requirement for electric vehicle charging and other solar requirements for environmental preservation. Uh, Ms. King, we've, we've hit the your two hmm? you, you've hit your time. Oh, oh, I, um, I know two minutes goes by so fast, doesn't it? So okay. I, I, I have a, a slip here that just has Susan on it, and so uh, if you are the person who wrote just Susan, perhaps you could put your full name on a slip and and put it in here. Uh, Jordan Weinstein uh, is next. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Jordan Weinstein, uh, Lennon Road, Precinct 21, Town Meeting Member. Um, I have a couple of questions to begin with for the uh, panel. Um, if you were to take this map and limit all of the orange uh, zones to three stories, and uh, basically that make that one change, can you give me a rough baseball uh, figure of what the total capacity would be? Matthew, is that something you know off the top of your head? or I'm going to guess and qualify that my answer is really just a guess, but we can go back and check. Um, I think it reduces the total capacity by you know, 3,000 maybe. 3,000? Yeah. Okay. And if you were to, to add to that uh, and reduce, um, limit the, uh, the blue zones to only four stories without any ability to build it higher with these bonuses, would that be about the same number, do you think? It would not change the modeled capacity. So for the purposes of the model, we assume yep. four stories. The bonus is extra. Okay. Um, with the amount of time I have left, then, uh, I think that that's a great plan. Uh, I think this is a dramatic overreach. I know that there's been a lot of resistance in this town, uh, in town meeting, rejecting uh, ARB rezoning uh, uh, warrant articles that would have increased density. And I see this as kind of pent up uh, eagerness on the part of the working group. And frankly, I don't see anybody on the working group that has any sense of moderation and is even uh, considering this kind of lower density. Instead, we're jumping from 10,000 uh, capacity to 15,000. Now we're up to 15,000. I think it's a mistake. 3,000, fine. But I don't think that there's much support for, for this kind of uh, overreach uh, and overcapacity in town meeting. And uh, frankly, I would vote against this as it is. Uh, and I would uh, also uh, lobby and campaign against we're it. At, we're out of time, Mr. J James. No, thank you, folks. James Fleming, James Fleming is next. And then after that, we will have Topher Hyam. Is that good? Is that better? Awesome. James Fleming, 15 Melrose Street. Right up to it. <laughs> um, I had a, James Fleming, 15 Melrose Street. I had a question about the assumptions used in the calculation for some of the districts. It seems very implausible that you could fit 10,000 units in that orange strip. Are you making an assumption about the size of the unit in that maximum number? The, yeah, the, the model assumes that units are 1,000 square feet. 1,000 square feet? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question that I had had was why you, you've picked 350 square, or, sorry, 350 feet as you're off of Mass Ave for the orange. Uh, that's arbitrary. You can go higher or lower. Was there a reason you picked the 350 in particular? Was there a uh, particular feedback that you had that said, you know, this seems like the right sort of ballpark, even if it's not the exact right number? 
Uh, there was a, a lot of feedback to extend the district back into the neighborhoods. And so you're right, it's a question of how deep. And um, so we tried to set it, you know, let's go back a full block, but sometimes the blocks are really, really long and sometimes they're really, really shallow. We said, let's just come up with a consistent sort of target, about 350 feet, which is a reasonable distance from the transit district, and see if we can apply it more or less in a way that's sort of rational and equitable. But okay. you're correct in that it could be 200, it could be, but we wanted to try something that was at least consistent. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to say that I like parts of this. We are in the Orange District. Um, we don't plan to leave Arlington anytime soon, but when we, if we ever did have to leave, um, our house would be worth a whole lot more because now you can build more units on it. That's great. I don't understand why everyone isn't clamoring to be part of this district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, so Topher Hyam and then, oh, I haven't pulled another one. After TOFA will be Colin Mincham. Okay, thank you. Topher Hyam, uh, 82 Richfield Road, Precinct 15, town meeting member. I have two questions. Um, one is on the uh, five foot side setbacks. Um, has anyone talked to the fire department about that? Because I know that that's, there are parts of the zoning code where it goes into materials and what you have to do if you have, say, a garage that's not close to the line. The uh, five foot setback is absolutely achievable within the, the fire code. Okay, it thank depends you. on the details of how the building is constructed and materials, but it's quite common. Okay. Um, the other question I had is, would you submit this entire plan to the, to, uh, the state, or would you submit a subset of it that would meet the state's requirements? I see Claire is ready to... Yeah. Sure. Where we are right now is this is the plan that we intend to forward to the state. Um, we are having this discussion tonight, which we will uh, work, you know, we'll, we'll talk about in the working group in our next meeting and see what, you know, we come up with um, as a result of the comments at this meeting. So, okay. uh, again, it's, it's on the table, um, but I think that it's a discussion the working group will, will have to have. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was Colin Mincham. Ah, great. And after that, we will have William Bowman. Hello, I'm Colin Mincham, 22 Bailey Road. Um, I applaud all the work that you folks have done and um, that what you pulled together today. I have a couple of concerns and issues. Number one, I found out about this whole process by a neighbor providing me with a flyer to then find my whole block is in orange zone. So the, the, a good job has not been done in getting it out there by all means necessary. And I, I would argue that everybody that's in a zone should have been flyered in advance to enable us to know to come. That's number one. Number two, to have somebody have to ask the question, what is the acreage and how many units are actually in this plan, I think is incorrect. It should have been on the website and up in fr front and center of all information because in some ways that's what some people are going to be voting based on. Other people have got different uh, reasons. So I think there needs to have been an improved uh, communication to enable people to make decisions. The last question I have is a repeat of something a gentleman asked earlier. I'm in a zone, whether or not I move out is part of it, but if next door gets bought and they, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a tall house, and they put in, somebody puts in plans for the four stories next door. I haven't heard an answer to the question, what the course do I have? It was answered, but that actually didn't answer the question. So as a homeowner, if somebody buys the property next door, what recourse do I have to object and to mitigate uh, the diminution of my, the quality of my space? Claire, do you have a? Um, I am not an attorney, um, so I can't answer the question about litigation. I, I, you know, I imagine if you'd like to litigate, you could certainly go right ahead. Um, if someone built a four-story house next to your house, you have the opportunity to come to a public meeting and express your dismay, anger, um, whatever, to comment on the design of the building, to comment on, you know, uh, uh, any, uh, the open space of the building, the parking of the building, you know, any, any of those things. However, we cannot say no housing, and we cannot 
say that someone can't do anything that is allowed in the zoning. So you would certainly have recourse but, to protest, um, but in terms of recourse to stop a development, you, I, I, I imagine, would have to litigate. Uh, okay, so we've, Thank you. We, we've so passed our time. That's not enough. Thank you. William Bowman, and then after that, Alex Bagno. Hi, my name is uh, William Bowman. I live at 12 Highland Avenue. A um, couple questions. Um, I share the same concern about capacity, and it seems like we may be biting off a little more than we can chew to, to rush this for planning for potentially 50 years from now. So I guess my question would be, can we cut that in half and maybe plan for 25 years? And I like the last gentleman's point about reducing the number from four floors to three floors would only lose 3,000 uh, units, which would um, bring us to still three times what the law is mandating right now. But I think the main goal is if we cut back the number of cap in capacity and units, we might be able to grow in a more healthy way when considering infrastructure and housing codes. Because I think in Highland, Highland Ave, that's like a big cut through between Mass Ave and Route 2. And uh, Wildwood is a very small road that would have a hard time facilitating four um, stories. And while I've lived there for the last 20 years, there's been many accidents where cars end up in front porches and houses and stop signs aren't maintained. So I get we need to grow. I think you guys are doing a great job. It's not an easy task. And I thank you for letting us talk. But the real question is, can we bite off a little less, maybe cut capacity in half and grow over time in a little more healthy way? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Alice Bagnell is next, and then uh, Wendy Richter. Should, should I answer this? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. Like, like I said, I, um, and I think that it's been made clear in the presentation tonight, this is a working group that is very open to public comment and very responsive to public comment. This is a public meeting. They will um, take in all the comments that are made tonight. Um, and go back and take a, a, a look at the, um, the del deliverables and see how we can best um, express public comment um, in the map again. So, Thanks. sure. Sorry. <laughs> Alice Bagnell uh, and then Wendy Richter. Hello, uh, Alex Bagel, Wyman Street, uh, safely on the edge of the Orange <laughs> District, and I believe only not a budding a blue district uh, because it is a commercially zoned property. Um, I would say, I think if we want to be considered a welcoming town, we actually have to be welcoming to new people. Now, while walking here, I would note that I passed a number of six and eight story buildings along the way, and that when walking the dog, we pass a lot of six and eight story buildings, primarily built before the 75 zoning rewrite. So I'm wondering if you could talk about not necessarily the difference between our existing zoning and what you're proposing, but what the built environment already contains, and that we as town residents apparently all feel passionately about, and what the delta is potentially between that and this, noting that some of those buildings on Mass Ave, I think, couldn't even be built under this zoning. Thank you. Steve or Matthew, yeah. Well, I, I, th I think you're absolutely right. A number of the buildings on Mass Ave apartment buildings could not be built under this zoning and could not be built under our existing zoning. Um, this do, this change will get us will it will get us back to some of the, the things that we used to allow, but have um, made illegal to build anew since 1975. Um, Wendy Richter is next, and then I have Emily Snyder. I'm Wendy Richter, 12 Rattle Place, um, town meeting member. Um, Precinct 17. Um, I uh, one thing I noted on this plan was that the biggest blue area runs along Mill Brook, and I just that's a concern because that's a floodplain, and we uh, had input about that, um, taking that into consideration when the zones were laid out. Um, the other thought that I had, I agree with a lot of things that I've heard um, expressed tonight, but one one concern I have is the width of Mass Ave changes from East Arlington into the Heights. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the uh, height of the buildings are basically the same all along the corridor. And I just would like to see that taken into account when you look at the height. 
I think six stories is too high. When you look at the two buildings that are across from each other near Stop and Shop, shop I think those are four stories. I, I'm not sure what they are now. Put another two stories on those, and canyon, it's, it's a canyon. Um, the other thought I had was that if you are going to have incentives for setbacks with adding stories, might you have that area somehow incentivize larger parcels? Because I think one of the problems that we have is we have such small existing parcels that to incentivize any kind of setbacks, there just isn't space to, to set things back and offer more green space, even within the, the lot. So that, that was another thought I had. Thank you. Thank you. We have Emily Snyder, uh, and then after that, uh, Chuck Carney. My name is Emily Snyder, 10 Milton Street, and I'm also in one of the orange areas. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, can you enlighten us a bit about how some of our contiguous towns are handling this issue? Matthew, you might be able to tell us about how other towns are. Um, I don't know in detail how your contiguous towns are handling it, but we are doing this same consulting work for um, Winthrop, Lincoln, um, Newton, um, they are, there's some very common themes, one of which is everyone wants to preserve their commercial districts, and so they are working this new, because the, the new district cannot require commercial, uh, many towns and municipalities are trying to sort of work around that. Um, I've also seen districts sort of evolve in each municipality from something that was minimally compliant to something that made more sense from a sort of planning standpoint. Um, but, you know, obviously different densities in different places. And my other, do they have a similar process to what we've had? Yes, and they have, uh, they have more time uh, because uh, theirs isn't due until next year, but there's this pressing uh, fossil fuel piece here which is hastening the decision-making process. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have Chuck Harney and then oh. after Chuck will be uh, Liz Reesberg. Hi, Chuck Harney, 2 Kimball Road, uh, Precinct 11 Town Meeting Member. My, my question has to do with affordable housing. Um, the state allows you to have 10% of the, of the map be affordable housing. Beyond that, you have to justify. And so the working group voted to go to 15%, which matches the current inclusionary zone. But the state allows you to go to 20% as part of the revised DHCD guidelines. So has the working group uh, thought about being more aggressive on affordable housing and going to 20%? Claire? Sure, I'm happy to answer that. And th these are still discussions that we're having about affordability and the affordability requirement. I think that generally, um, and certainly, correct me if I'm wrong, working group, we are all interested in, um, you know, a, a bonus for anybody who is going to go above and beyond the 15%. Um, what we can't necessarily do, I think, is, is uh, um, petition the state to say, we want to do more affordable housing than we require in other parts of the town in the NBTA community zone by right. That would be non-compliant because it would be um, putting... So the, yeah. the town guidelines has been go to 20% without any bonuses. I mean, the state guideline. That's correct, but our town guideline right now is 15. To the town, right. So, correct. but does this working group have the ability to make it 20? I mean, it's a lot of changes that you're making. The working group has the ability right now to make anything over what we currently have a bonus. So yes, they could potentially go to 20, but right now what we have in town that's applicable across the entire town is 15. Okay, so just so I understand, forget about bonuses. As part of this plan, if there were no bonuses, we couldn't go to 20%. Go ahead, Steve. So the, the idea is that we can't require something of the MBTA communities district that's greater than what we would require for normal development. So because the rule is 15% everywhere else, we need to Got keep it. it 15. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have next Liz, Liz Reesberg, uh, who 
was sitting here and I don't see her anymore. Liz, if you're still here, wave your hand. And then I have Andrew Greenspawn next. And then I'll pull another name. Uh, Allison Griggs after that. Allison. Uh, okay, great. Andy Greenspawn, uh, 89 Palmer Street, town meeting member, Precinct 5. I'm very enthusiastic about this proposal. Um, I'm right adjacent to this district, though I wouldn't mind personally being in it at all. I live in East Arlington for walkability and access to public transit, where a lot of this district is proposed, along Mass Ave as well. Uh, my wife can't drive and takes the bus to and from work many times uh, a week, um, and I drive as little as possible because of my location. A lot of my friends uh, in Arlington and surrounding areas have one car for two or three people or zero cars if they live in an area with public transit. Uh, we need more housing for people like that. I think that's what this is designed to do. Uh, many folks my age, um, I don't know if I'm the youngest person here, one of the younger people, uh, cannot afford to buy housing in Arlington, let alone barely rent here. We need missing middle housing, not McMansions, which is what happens when a single family house runs out of its life and somebody eventually moves away uh, a house in 50 or 70 years. If it's single family zoned, it's going to be a McMansion that happened in my neighborhood in Newton. Uh, they're all $3 million houses. Um, we need missing middle, which is triple deckers, six plexes, four or even six stories that are a variety of prices for seniors who want to downsize, um, pe single people, people starting families, etc. So my question, because there are a lot of people concerned about where they live and what this means for their property specifically is a question to you all is, if you own a property and you are in this overlay and it is passed, does that require anything of you um, or, or change how you, your property exists? Does it compel you to do anything? Claire or Matthew? Or? Uh, the answer is no. Okay. So that um, – does this affect existing uh, owners in condo associations where somehow they could be compelled to sell their property? No. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. I support this. Thank you all. Okay, next we have Allison Griggs, and then after that, Gina Rodriguez. And just in case people have left, if, if I call your name, if you could just wave so that I know whether I need to pull in. Oh, Gina? Okay, great. Hello. My name is Allison Griggs. I live at 126 Mass Ave. I am in a blue section. I am here to support this proposal. I um, get really frustrated when I find out from contrarians that this is happening. So I will say, like, the only thing is just getting the word out there. But beyond that, I think this is an incredible job and very thoughtful. Um, it, I don't know what people are scared about because, like, the person before me, I live in high density. I live in Arlington. I work in Arlington. I manage a small business. My money is made here. My money is spent here. I hope to raise kids here. I can get to the bus. I ride my bike to work. I can get to the train. This is the dream. I live the dream life. I wouldn't be able to be here without having this type of housing. I wouldn't be able to afford to live here continually without this type of housing. I don't know what people are scared of because I'm the type of person that benefits from this. So I would hope that everyone can see me and see that I'm a contributing member of the society that we live in and that this is literally a dream life for me. It may not be for you, but you don't have to live that type of life. That's, this isn't forcing anything upon anybody, aside from making it possible to expand over the long term. So I'm happy to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with my neighbors about this, and I'm so happy that everyone's here to voice concerns and have those types of things. I believe these fine people up here took all of the aspects and all of the voices into this proposal and thinking about that for the future. So that's all I really want to say. Um, my only question is, um, I know that there was a lot of climate concerns and sustainability and I support all the people um, talking about put setbacks and things like that. I was wondering if one of you could succinctly talk about how climate forward this proposal actually is, because that wasn't super tangible to me. Okay. Well, we're, we're out of time, so I, we'll maybe circle back to that in a, in a little bit. Gina Rodriguez, um, and then Aram uh, Hallman. Gina Rodriguez, uh, 6th Daniel Street. 
Um, I think that anything that we can do to help with uh, the environmental crisis that we are living in, that many of us won't get to leave the consequences, uh, I think it's worth it. Um, with that said, I think that a lot of things could actually be taken into consideration. Uh, for example, charging stations for electric cars, um, and also more reliability on public transportation, right? Because if we're going to bring all these people close to public transportation, but then we're not going to be able to service them, it's just going to be difficult. Um, I live in the Heights, and I really don't understand what the Heights rezoning study means. And so and people have asked about it, uh, but I, it's not really clear to me. I know that most of it is already uh, commercial, but what does it mean to a you know, two-family house, uh, the one that I live in? Sure. So, really quickly, this is a um, the the ARB um, has a suite of about um, ten articles or so um, that they're going to uh, bring forward on the Warren article along with MBTA communities that are related to the business. One of the things they would like to do is consolidate the many different business zones in Arlington Heights under one Arlington Heights business district zone. I think that B one through five is represented on this short, you know, stretch of, of Mass Ave. And so as a way to sort of consolidate the zoning um, and make it, you know, um, fair and consistent across all businesses in the area, they are looking to implement the Arlington Heights business zone, which will eliminate B one through five in the area. Um, it's a recommendation that came out of the Arlington Heights neighborhood action plan, and it will go forward as a, as a potential article. Um, the same as MBTA communities in the fall. Okay. And where can I find information about it? Sure, that's a great question. Um, there is some information available on the website. There's, the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan is on the website, and then we have minutes left over from ARB meetings late last fall where we discussed this. It will come up again um, in ARB hearings related to um, town meeting this fall. Thank you. So we have Aram Hallman and then uh, Susan Stamps. Aaron Holman, 12 Whittemore Street, town meeting member, Precinct 6. A um, couple of comments here. Um, first, a criticism. I don't think the working group has been doing a very good job. Unfortunately, it's not your fault because you've been asked to do something impossible and you have been asked to do something which is not really in Arlington's best interest. You have been asked by this or told by this state law to create capacity. Arlington doesn't need capacity. It needs housing. You're asking about the future. We need housing now. We don't need just housing. We need affordable housing. And the law which you're working under severely limits that. We need preservation of business. This law does not deal with that. So, in a way, you're not doing a very good job because of the constraints under which you're operating. I do have some things that I would like. First, as other people have pointed out, this is an experiment. Let's keep it to 2,046 units, which is what's required. Nothing more than that. You can always expand at a later point. Another thing. I think other people have proposed, and you have not really responded to proposals by other people, but you basically just got this one plan, and that's it. We would like the software and the data so that other people can try it. I think some of us can do a better job, or since we're paying for it, we certainly ought to be allowed to try to do a better job. Um, I think we ought to stop calling it the MBTA law because since we're an adjacent community, this really has nothing to do with the MBTA. I think you exempted, you chose to put all this in the most dense part of town. 
despite the fact that in your own discussions, some of which I attended, you said, hey, doing it in dense parts of town, you don't get much of a gain. M Mr. Holman, we've hit, you've hit your, your time limit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Susan Stamps and then Nicole Gustas. Nicole. Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Susan Stamps. I'm a town meeting member of Precinct 3 and um, on the Tree Committee and the Gas Leaks Task Force. We applaud the work of the um, Planning Department and the Working Group to come up with a plan. Um, however, we, we feel, and we think they've done great work, but the, there's a big, huge gap in the plan, which is that, yes, it's environmentally friendly because it's dense and that by definition is environmentally friendly, it's energy efficient, and we're not cutting down trees in the suburbs. But the problem is that it is not allowing big enough setbacks on the street so that the, the residents, our new neighbors in this dense housing, will have the same leafy streetscape as we do. The opportunity to go down the street, greet their neighbors, pause in a 15-foot setback for have a chat, and um, enjoy being in Arlington and also take refuge from uh, the effects of climate change, which as we all know, I think after the hottest July in recorded history, we're in now. Um, I'm a member of a new group called Green Streets Arlington, uh, greenstreetsarlington.org. We are advocating for climate-friendly environmental green space, open space, trees to be worked into the plan. We have had many conversations with the environmental planner, the planning department, and the working group, and we really appreciate uh, their being receptive to our to talking with us, but we are asking for not a 10-foot setback, not a zero-foot setback, but a 15-foot setback in all of the residential parcels to make room for planting trees. The uh, UTL um, consultant the other day told the working group 10 feet is not enough to plant a tree. There are many times when on the, the, the tree strip or the sidewalk near the building, you can't plant a tree because there yes. are wires. Ms. Stamps here. Yeah, okay. So, thank you very much. And Arlington, greentreesarlington.org. Thank you. Okay. Nicole, Gu Nicole Gustas is next, and then afterwards, Anne LaRoyer. Hi, I'm Nicole Gustas. I live on 89 Marathon Street, which is right under one of those orange blocks. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say, um, I, I moved to Arlington because Arlington doesn't do the bare minimum. I looked at a lot of different places to move. And the thing about Arlington, and you can look back to the Revolutionary War, Arlington has never done the bare minimum. And I am really excited to see a plan that is bold and goes beyond the bare minimum in order to get more housing and more effective use of land into the area. Um, I am in one of those orange zones. Honestly, most of the houses are really three stories because people are living on the top floor. So going to four stories, that's not a huge change. I got a flyer that implied that this was going to be something like what happened in the West End, where uh, my family was booted out because the entire neighborhood was leveled. And I think there are a few people here who might be old enough to remember when that happened in the late 50s and early 60s. I'm really glad I came to this meeting because I was shocked to find out that's not at all what we're talking about. All we're talking about is rezoning to allow building of larger buildings and affordable housing. It, this just seems like a no-brainer to me, uh, and it would bring a lot of potential. I'm really excited about it, and I want to congratulate you guys on a bold plan. Thank you. Anne LaRoyer next, and then we have David Maltzahn. David, I don't, okay, I'll have another name afterward in case David isn't here. Go ahead, Anne. Hi, um, Anne LaRoyer, um, I live in um, Pear Street in the Heights. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 17, and I'm also a member of the Open Space Committee. And I also want to thank the committee and the planning department for, I know, a lot of work and a lot of challenges to try to come up with a plan in a very short time. Um, 
I also want to support the Green Streets um, efforts and the Open Space Committee is working on also trying to advocate for much more uh, front setbacks especially so that trees can be put into the front um, fronts of some of these buildings, especially in the neighborhood areas. Um, so I just want to reinforce that um, goal of trying to get more open space, more public open space. Um, my main question is about the heights, again. I know several people have raised it, and Claire, you've, you've answered some of the questions, but, um, and I, I know that there's been some work in the past that's been done about this, but I, do, I guess I don't understand how the new zoning and the heights is gonna mesh with the zoning uh, regulations that are being proposed through here if both of these um, proposals are gonna be put into town, fall town meeting how are they going to be synchronized? Steve? Yeah. yeah, so the changes to the Arlington Heights Business District will not be coming up this fall. Uh, that will be in the spring. No. Well, I was told it was going to be in the fall, but... Oh, okay. Well, I stand corrected. Yeah, it's going to be in the fall. Um, Claire, did you want to add? Sure. I don't necessarily think that these um, two... Uh, these two zones are in, um, you know, competition or, or, or somehow are counter to each other. I think one of the things the ARB, one, one of the reasons they are interested in, you know, this reservation of, of the commercially zoned property and what they want to do in the Heights is, I think, um, more mixed use. Um, and I think, you know, combining um, these business uses in the Heights under one um, B district that, is, that allows mixed use um, will give the board um, some more flexibility um, and certainly will give proponents of projects in the area a lot more clarity on the expectations for we're, business uses, business development, and things like that. Okay, we're, we're time. Yeah, but I, I still don't quite understand how these two are going to be presented uh, at the same time. Uh, so I'll, find, I'll go to your public meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, we had David Maltz on next. But I wasn't sure that. It, okay, Mark Kapline. And after Mark Kapline, we have Charlie Blandy. Is Charlie still here? Oh, yep. Hi, thank you, Mark Kapline, Precinct Nine. I live at 11 Palmer Street. I have for almost 35 years now. Um, I've got a couple of observations. Well, the first suggestion is your outreach to the social clubs because most of the outreach has been to sort of progressive enclaves and not so much the social clubs. Um, so my district is, is almost is overwhelmingly renters, and I've been living in East Arlington for a long time. And again, that's uh, primarily a renting area, or has been traditionally. And so we, we see that this plan is kind of a rich man, poor man plan. It puts the burden of this additional development on traditionally lower income areas of Arlington. And this amplifies the spread between the wealthy, the haves and the have nots in town. You know, even here we can see between Bartlett Avenue and Lakes and Spy Pond, None, none of the higher density is included in those areas. That's where the money is. And again, they're protected from higher density, higher stress, loss of green space. And I'll also, another observation I had is, um, apparently you don't consider the bike path to be a transportation corridor, because you've gone above and beyond the MBTA minimum, and yet, there's very little uh, adjacency to the bike path, only the spy pond conducts. So you might consider the bike path being a transportation option and not just a recreational facility. And the other bike path that's along Route 16, again, none of that is included, nor is the proposed bike path along the Mystic. So uh, have you uh, done any um, median income comparisons of, of the project areas, or the zoning areas versus not, and seeing how you're amplifying the difference. All right, thank you. We're out of time, but I think you have a short answer for that. Uh, the short answer to that is no, we have not evaluated um, 
this district in terms of the underlying income levels. So we have Charlie Blandy, and then after that, Carl Wagner. Oh, that's not very polite to put your name in twice. Okay. Uh, after it will be, go ahead, Charlie, and then after that will be Len Cardin. Thanks. Um, I'm, this is Charlie Blandy. Um, I live at 58 Lombard Terrace, um, and I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 6. And I want to thank the working group and um, the consultant and the town staff for all of the work that they've done on this. Um, it's really, it's very impressive. Um, I wanted to address one of the concerns that I think that um, stops a lot of people, which is, does new market rate housing actually address the affordability crisis? And um, the answer to that is a resounding yes, and that comes from um, work that's been done uh, in housing scholarship for the last 20 years, but there's an especially growing consensus of housing scholarship over the last uh, seven or eight years. And so I. I urge people to, if they haven't already, look for a paper that's from the Furman Center at New York University, and it's called Supply Skepticism. And um, it addresses a lot of the arguments about uh, whether affordability uh, is improved by new market rate housing or whether it doesn't. And um, in fact, this uh, was a result of a state mandate, and it's a regional mandate. We're going with 170 other communities that also have to um, create transit-oriented development. And uh, even sometimes the, um, the close-in effect of new market rate housing can alleviate rent increases. There was a researcher in San Francisco who uh, looked at new housing that was uh, developed on the site of old fires and found that there was a 2% decrease in rents within a 100 meter uh, radius. Um, filtering, even if you build new market rate housing and even if it's expensive, people filter into that and they leave behind housing behind them. That becomes then naturally affordable. So um, anyway, I, I probably at time, but um, thanks for your work. And well done. Thank you. Len Cardin and then Gordon Jameson. Thanks, Len Cardin, 65 Tanager Street. Uh, thank you all for staying so late and hearing all of us in our thoughts. Um, I'm very supportive of more housing in Arlington. I think we need to do it on Mass Ave and Broadway, and I'm a little bit disappointed about all the exclusions that you have there. But given my limited time, I want to focus on the neighborhood multifamily subdistrict because I think we need to ask what we're trying to do there and why. If we had a, a blank slate or even partially open canvas, it completely makes sense to build more larger multifamily housing in the proposed zone, but we don't. We were talking about the built environment. The built environment is a 100-year-old, two, two and a half story buildings, um, most um, multifamily, two units. Um, what we're doing is we're incentivizing those to be torn down and replaced with four story, three or four unit luxury condos because that's what's gonna happen. But it's gonna happen sporadically. It's gonna be one building here, one building there, very slowly over the years. And so what we'll have is we'll have uh, a street like Surrey or, or Higgins or Laurel, particularly those streets that run parallel to Mass Ave that you've put completely in this zone. They're all solely, you know, single family, uh, two and a half story buildings, multifamily buildings right now, two family buildings. Suddenly one of those will turn over, someone will pass away, the building hasn't been maintained, it'll be torn down and a four story building will go up there. What I'd like to see is some drawings of what that will look like so people in town can see that. Um, I, I really think we're overreaching here. We don't need to do that. Those aren't gonna be affordable units. They aren't gonna be six unit buildings. Those, most of those lots, if you look at those lots, they're 6,000 square feet, maybe 8,000 square feet. Nobody's gonna build six units there with an affordable unit added. They're all gonna be luxury condos. So I would really ask that we take another look at that district, make it smaller, consider the three story limit. Newton's, Newton's doing sticking with two and a half stories. Lexington did three stories. We're, Let's do the same. Thank you. We're going to go to Gordon Jameson uh, and then Gary Goldsmith. Gary, are you? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Gordon Jameson, 163 Situate, town meeting member, Precinct 12. 
and I'm also currently the chair of the Board of Assessors. I'm speaking in my um, resident Precinct 12 capacity. Um, very quickly, I wanted to go through a few things. Yes, we need more MBTA service. The 79 needs to be restored and the 80. We spend, we give them $3.3 million a year and they keep taking stuff away from us. Um, for those who are not familiar, the biz, business zoning setback throughout town is zero, like in the center. Inspectional services had a, has had a change of leadership, so that, that um, concern that was raised earlier hopefully has gone away. Town meeting has passed several uh, higher density um, proposals over the last several years, including mixed use zoning, zoning in the business districts. And my rhetorical question, if we only do the minimum, where do you do it? Good, I have my minute that I hope to have left. So I'm, I'm, I agree that we need transit-based smart growth. We used to talk about that in town meeting when I first joined, smart growth along our business corridors. Now, um, what people don't really understand is what people can build now. So if I'm correct, the, along Mass Ave and parts of Broadway, the existing zoning allows four to six stories Yes or no, in general? Uh, in parts, uh, up to, depending on district, it can go up to five. Okay. Thank you. And then, so I think it would be helpful to, to come up with a map that showed the heights along there so one could understand the corridors. And then to the consultant, the capacity of the existing housing in the acreage, what is that and what is the capacity with our existing zoning in the acreage? I don't know. We haven't done that calculation. I have it for town meeting, please. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to Gary Goldsmith next and then Kathleen Maloon. Kathleen, are you still here? I don't see, so I'll pull another name while Gary's going. So, hello, Gary Goldsmith, uh, 91 Beverly Road, um, town meeting member, Precinct 11. Uh, there are many things that have changed in town since I moved here in 1985 and raised my family. Um, I never expected when I moved here to be able to get uh, beer with dinner downtown. Um, but the town is still green and, if anything, greener, uh, and it's a wonderful place to live. In the 38 years that I've lived here, uh, many things have changed. Uh, and what we are doing is planning for a town, what this town will look like 38 years from now. Um, if, uh, um, um, so today's 10-year-old will be 48 years old, uh, and what will their town be, be like? And we are making decisions for the, what that town is going to be like at that time, and it's not just a question of housing. Um, but uh, I, I applaud the uh, approach to long-term thinking as opposed to short-term thinking, which uh, often has led to problems in uh, a variety of things. Um, uh, a couple of things that I would say. One is that uh, um, uh, I, I appreciate the work that this uh, uh, this uh, committee has done. It's uh, this project is sort of like an elephant. It depends on how you handle it, uh, what it looks like. So you are sort of elephant handlers here. Um, I would say that. Uh, a couple of things quickly. The challenges of creating setbacks are significant. Uh, someone said, oh, this table is like six feet. This table is eight feet. Uh, the setbacks, uh, a setback of 10 feet is slightly longer than this table, maybe two feet longer than that. Um, I think that uh, Green Street's Arlington has approached this uh, from the standpoint of producing uh, more trees in Arlington. Uh, one point that has not been made is that although we're figuring on uh, there's some high number of houses, but that's assuming that, house, that the houses are 1,000 square feet. That means that they are all uh, either studios or probably not one bedroom we're apartments. Uh, these might be starter houses for other people. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have next Elizabeth Pyle, and then after that, Beth Malofchik. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Pyle. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 8. I would like to request that the commission put forward alternative maps showing different levels of density. 
It was said tonight that this particular map would call for an additional 12 to 15,000 units. I think that you should also put out a map at the 2,400, 2,046 units, and then maps in the middle, 6,000, 10,000. But because of the considerable disagreement in the room about the level of density that is required, necessary, or advisable here, I believe that you owe it to your constituents here in town and the residents here in town to put forward multiple alternative maps that clearly show the number of units that you're talking about. That's my, my first concern. My second concern is that if this map is showing 15,000 additional units, you only have 20,000 units in town right now. That's a 75% increase in the number of dwelling units in town. What does a 75% increase look like in terms of the town's ability to provide services? Have you talked to the Capital Planning Committee? Have you addressed this with the demographer of the school department? The answer, though, that is on your website that says that uh, there's been a, a decrease in elementary school enrollment doesn't cut it in terms of what is likely to occur here with uh, influx of people of different ages coming in with new housing being developed. So uh, the new high school is sized for 1,700 students, a 75% increase in town. If that translates, that's an additional 1,250 students. All right, thank, thank you. you. So these impacts need to be addressed before you make this you. level of change. Thank you. Yep. Beth Malofchuk and then Kristen Anderson. Yep. Beth Malofchuk, 20 Russell Street, town meeting member, precinct 9. I think the uh, plans presented are predicated on a functioning public transportation system, which we know we don't have. I don't, um, or it hasn't been presented in an adequate way to me to see that this is about affordability or school teachers being able to buy million dollar condos. Um, I, I will not be able to vote for this plan. I will be unlikely to vote for anything uh, beyond just a straightforward compliance to see how that gets applied. And I think that every single project the town takes on should be looked at through a lens of climate breakdown. We're in climate breakdown. We have the hottest summer in a year that's going to be the coolest year for the next four years. We're facing the loss of the Gulf Stream by 2025. So please go back to the drawing board. Please listen to the remarks tonight from Liz Pyle, from Elizabeth Carr Jones, from Susan Stamps. We need 15 foot setbacks. We need shade trees so people can walk to the store. And the retired folks and the elderly going to appointments are not going to ride their bicycle. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Kristen Anderson next, and then uh, Charles Foskett. Is Charles, is Charlie here? No? Oh, he is there. Okay, yep. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Anderson, uh, I live at 12 Upland Road West, and I'm a town meeting member. And I want to thank um, especially UTIL for the good work that they've done, and also the uh, working group and the planning department, as well as the ARB. Um, uh, I run a business in the Heights, and um, the plan that we see before us uh, now includes protection for all businesses in the commercial zones, both industrial um, and business. Local businesses provide services, products, and jobs to the community, which makes Arlington a better place to live, and I am extremely um, in favor of a plan that protects our businesses. So thank you for that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say um, is that uh, I think that 
we really do need to have 15 or 20 foot setbacks for trees. Um, in addition to being a town meeting member, um, I uh, am a co-founder of Save the Illwife Brook, and two of the things that we are interested in are um, water quality um, of the Illwife Brook, but we're also interested in, I'm also interested in, in other water bodies, including um, Mystic Lake and um, the Mill Brook uh, Spy Pond, Hills Pond. And um, if we have trees, that will help to uh, uh, drink up some of this storm water. It'll take rainwater and keep it from uh, turning into um, uh, a pollutant. Uh, additionally, um, I'm very concerned about flooding. And I think that if we have more trees and room for green stormwater infrastructure, that uh, it will help reduce flooding. And um, so thank you very much. I hope that you'll take those things into consideration. And again, thank you for protecting um, uh, our businesses. Thank you. We have Charles Foskett and then Carol, Carol Kowalski. Thank you, uh, Charlie Foskett, uh, Precinct 10, and uh, member of the Finance Committee. Um, and uh, thank you to the working group for the uh, tremendous effort that you put in to get us uh, where we are today. However, I'm concerned about where we are today. Um, I think this capacity issue is a very serious one, and I can't imagine that you would bring this before town meeting without a detailed financial analysis of what the cost to the taxpayer is. The school committee has asked for another seven to eight million dollars in the next couple of years, which is coming uh, as part of an override request in the uh, in the fall. And that's roughly uh, uh, at the same time contemporary with uh, the town meeting that uh, this subject will come up at. Uh, this is, in my, in my view, this is a plan. The, co the capacity cannot be afforded by the taxpayers in Arlington. And, and I think that right now we're in a situation where we have mostly residential uh, citizens paying 93% of the taxes. And if we increase the density by another 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever the number is, we need to know what it costs. So I would ask that you not bring this before town meeting uh, without a detailed financial analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Carol Kowalski next, and then after that, Stephen Weil. Carol Kowalski, 182 Situate Street. I want to thank the working group for all your hard work. I want to thank Util, and I want to thank the, the board. Uh, I uh, heard Mr. Revelak say that um, it's either in the commercial districts or in residential. And I, I want you to open your minds, please, to the possibility that there are and have been for a long time. I, I had the privilege of working for the town as planning director for several years, and we looked at a lot of these sites that were crying out to be redeveloped, and they're of substantial size, and they're outside of the, uh, the, the core of the commercial districts. 28 Mass Ave should, should really be considered for inclusion, for example. These are sites that for years, 30 years, I've been thinking, and I'm not the only one, who's been thinking that could be a beautiful gateway to our town. Uh, it's, there are lots of properties in Arlington in these proposed districts that might be in a flood zone, but they're not no-build areas and there are ways to do it. That could be a fantastic um, site. 28 Mass Ave, also uh, 30 Mystic Street. 30 Mystic Street is a massive parking lot and a 50-year-old <laughs> office building and it's recessed down so it's cited in a way where uh, I, I want to keep going because I so please take a look at that. That's it's, it's crying out. It's perfectly smart growth. Uh, also, the Greater Boston Motorsports Block. Stand across the street from it. Stand in front of Jimmy's. Look at it and say, "Oh my gosh, it almost looks like an apartment building." Mm -hmm. And say to yourself, "Why isn't that included? What are we? We do not have a split tax rate. I and, and I don't think two other quick things. I don't think we're Sure, we should look, maybe look at what it would cost, but these properties will pay taxes, and new multifamily development is more valued and gives us more revenue than depreciated 50-year-old commercial buildings that we struggle to tenant right now. 
I don't think, I know we don't. I work as a professional planner. We don't have a commercial development market. So um, the Greater Boston Motorsports, 37 Broadway, uh, I, I really, Friday, 2 p.m., anyone who wants to meet with me, I'll help you walk those, those sites. And I'm also walking the districts, and I recommend that you do the same thing. Thank, Thank you, you so you're, much. Your time. Thank you. Uh, we have Stephen Weil uh, and then Joe Zeff. Joe Zeff? Stephen Weil? Okay. I have um, Ratnakar Vilani. Vilanki? Hi, Ratnakar Valanki, 21 Adam Street. Uh, I'm in one of those orange areas, and I welcome this plan. And I thank all the uh, working group members to put in their effort and volunteered for, for this. Um, now, a few things, right? I know a lot of speakers before me um, have said that higher density is not good, but I just would like to reiterate that higher density saves much more green space than it saves, uh, than it uses, sorry. Higher density is also more financially sustainable. And in addition to that, right, in addition to the sustainability argument, um, I would like to also extend and say that this is also one step, one good step forward towards protecting an owner's right to decide how best to use their property. Not my words. These are the words of Justice uh, John Paul Stevens, Supreme Court. Um, and it continues the opinion saying, which we've forgotten, this right we've forgotten. Uh, this was enshrined in English common law, which we've forgotten since the 1926 ruling of the court. Now, coming to uh, another topic, which is what I originally wanted to make. Now, the Section 3A guidelines that were outlined by the Attorney General of the Commonwealth also say that the multi multifamily zoning district should be in areas that are safe, accessible, and convenient access to transit stations for pedestrians and bicyclists, right? Keywords for pedestrians and bicyclists. Now, we know that uh, in the proposed Mass Ave and Broadway corridor, we know that uh, there's no bike lane on Broadway, and the bike lane is pretty much non-existent on Mass Ave, right? Um, I would like to request the working uh, group members to consider having separated or protected bike lanes on both Broadway and Mass Ave, uh, because, not just because clearly Section 3A guidelines require that, because one could say that we'd be in breach of that without safe access, but more importantly, uh, you know, it's probably the, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We're at time. Uh, Matthew, I think you had something from earlier that you wanted to circle back to. Yeah, a, a, a clarification. It was suggested that the number of units that the model is, is estimating, 12, 15,000, uh, is in addition to existing units. That is not the case. That number is as if all of those parcels, all those blue and orange areas were completely vacant and people were building as of right. So it's, I just want to get that clarific sure. clarification out there. Thank you. And next I have Juliet Furman, and then after that, Brian McBride. <coughs> Juliet Furman. Right, Brian, you're up then. And after Brian, we'll have Steve Michalka. Hi, good evening. Uh, this is working. Yeah, I'm Brian McBride. I live at 36 Eastern Avenue. I'm a member of the Conservation Commission and a, and a member of the Open Space Co Committee. Uh, tonight I'm speaking as a member of Green Streets Arlington. So um, my job, <laughs> I know everyone's tired, my job is to try to convince you all that we shouldn't submit this plan with 10 feet of setback. I think that's a terrific mistake. And the reason for that uh, is setback is very important for your experience of the streetscape. When we look at the table model, plus two feet, I guess, here, that's not enough uh, of a setback to really have a green space. It's not enough for the tree warden to plant a tree that's sustainable. So consider that when you've got a higher temperature in 25 years, when we've got five or six story buildings along Mass Ave, when we've got people using the subway, or sorry, the, the bus, <laughs> and waiting for the bus on the street, we're trying to drive engagement with community members to knit the community together, right? The setback, although it seems like a trivial kind of architectural number, 
is really important for how we envision our future community. It's the trade when we look at increased density, but we try to build in a pleasant uh, living and walking environment and something that's in sync with our habitat. So I really encourage the, the committee not to submit a plan with 10 foot setback. Please look at 15 or 20 per the tree warden and let's make this a win-win. We need the housing, we need the green streets. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have Steve Mikauka and then I think um, we have a clarification or circle back on something. Good evening, Steve McCallick, uh, 17 Russell Street. I am um, a member of the Historical Cultural Resources Working Group, um, working on implementing the town master plan. Um, also chair of the Arlington uh, Historic District Commission. Uh, with my Historic District Commission hat, just a couple of comments. One, um, it was mentioned that the current plan avoids historic districts. I mentioned to Claire earlier, and I just want to reiterate to the full committee um, that it's still, um, the map is drawn up now, still covers uh, half of one of our historic districts. So I hope that gets resolved. Um, but that brings up another point. Um, I've um, looked at uh, other communities, um, Brookline, of which other places, Belmont, all of them have had uh, representatives of cultural and historical resources as part of the committee, thinking more broadly about um, meeting housing goals, but doing that in a way that's compatible with all the other community objectives. Um, and I just encourage the working group to be, to do more outreach to other folks to learn about those things. Because I feel that there hasn't been a lot of outreach here. I commend all the work that the uh, working group has done, but I think they are working in a very compressed time environment. And that leads to my first question. I understand we're doing that because of the need to meet the um, gas ban. Um, I understand there's only 10 communities in Massachusetts that will be able to be involved with that. If Arlington does not, what are, as I understand it, the next towns that would be included in that group would be Somerville and Boston. Is that correct? They are on the list, yes. I'm sorry? They're on the list. They're on the waiting list. So yeah. if Arlington does not do it this November and does not participate in the first phase of that ban, Somerville may get the opportunity to be part of that group. They may. It's contingent on the state's decisions, but they are in line, so they, they so could comply. So just from an environmental perspective, if we're, you want the biggest here, bang here, for the buck, here, uh, I, I'm just, uh, you have four, six more seconds. No, biggest no, bang for the buck. Actually, I, I don't know why this, you're, why you're that short-term thing is driving it, our effort to do something that's really, you, really complicated in a short period of time. Mr. Mikowski, you, you're actually passed by six, by now 20 seconds. Sorry. <laughs> um, One last request. Do, do, Can you put all these Q&A up on an FAQ for people to get? It's, everyone's leaving tonight. The whole thing is recorded. <laughs> so, um, D David, your, your time is over. Um, I think, David, you also had some other things from earlier that you wanted to, something you wanted to clarify? I do. We've had a lot of conversations about environmental concerns tonight and just Quickly show of hands, how many people know who Bill McKibben is? How many people know who Bill McKibben is? Majority of the room, Bill McKibben, world-renowned environmental activist. He is from Lexington, you may not know that piece, and he wrote a piece in The New Yorker, of all places, when MBTA communities passed in Lexington celebrating their accomplishment and chiming in not just on the environmental front, but from the equity perspective, that this is a very valuable thing to do that addresses the climate crisis and does so in a just way. So I have to say I support Bill's decision to do that and his position in that way. I want to say that there are things that we need to look to beyond zoning to really realize the things that we're discussing tonight. So. Um, we, we can get to those in a subsequent conversation, but I think the, the more meaningful piece for tonight is that MBTA, zone, MBTA communities is a zoning bylaw. We can work on other kinds of uh, compliance with, um, you know, promoting public transit, et cetera, in other venues. There are other ways to meet those goals, and I think you will find that the town is very receptive 
to accomplishing those goals. There are some things within the zoning code that we may also change in order for them to apply to MBTA communities. And one of those things is the site development standards mentioned earlier, broadening that to not just apply to the districts where they currently apply, but to have public shade trees required in new development, redevelopment, uh, large additions, etc. You get a public shade tree in addition to uh, the context that I just described. So there are ways within and without zoning that we can accomplish a number of these things. And I really welcome the conversation about this because it engenders further conversation about how we get to those goals. So just the clarification that there are some things that we can apply within zoning that have bearing on much that we've discussed and others that we want to pursue perhaps as soon as Springtown meeting and we're open to having those conversations. Thank you. Uh, Chris Loretti is next and then I'll pull another name while Chris. Um, Narissa Smoger. Thank you, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street, town meeting member precinct seven. I think the map should have names instead of numbers. And I would call this one the shit on East Arlington map. As someone who, who lives in that area, um, you really are concentrating, um, particularly on Broadway. And uh, I find it astounding that people are claiming that this is in keeping with the neighborhood. The south side of Broadway is predominantly two family homes of two and a half stories. And you're gonna be building or allowing a by right six story, 60 foot building, five feet from my property line. And I'm supposed to think that's fitting for the neighborhood? Well, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, I, I appreciate the efforts of the, uh, of the committee, but I think you've kind of missed the boat on the location of these zones. What I was hearing in the previous public meetings is people wanted to spread it out, put it near Alewife. You haven't even covered most of the bus routes. Why are you concentrating only on Broadway and Massachusetts Avenue? Um, it's kind of clear to me that the, the committee was more interested in listening to themselves than in listening to the public. And so the, a couple of requests I'd like to make is, I think it's, it's gonna be necessary to do a substitute motion at town meeting. I'd like to know either from the committee or staff, what support you will give um, people in making the substitute motion to ensure compliance with the, um, with the MBTA Communities Act. Will you allow the use of UTIL? Will you allow the use of the model? Will you encourage DHCD to pass judgment on any substitute motion so that town meeting will know the alternative is an acceptable plan. And um, finally, I think you know, the, the whole idea that this is gonna create affordable housing is just delusional. I don't need academic studies. All I need to do is walk down the street into my neighborhood and see what happens when two family houses, um, typically owner occupied with one unit rented out are sold to developers and, and then sold as condos for over a million dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Narissa Smoger, uh, and then after that, Dorothy Gosline. Dorothy, are you? Okay, okay, you know, Narissa and then you. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Go ahead, sorry. Hi everyone, it's okay. It's my first meeting. Um, thank you to the committee. I really appreciate the work um, that's gone into this clearly. Um, I'm new to Arlington, I'm on 30 Temple Street. I have some concerns about this plan as is. While I admire the spirit of the plan, I feel like there are some aspirational aspects without the safeguards to ensure smart implementation of the plan. For example, you know, we want, I biked to work today and then I took the train and the bus home. It took me over two hours to get home. I don't see that changing when we have more people that need to be relying on this type of transportation. What can we do to make this experience better for more people? Um, I think the way that this plan is outlined is, as others have said, it's a big bang all at once potentially, even though we don't expect that, it could be. Um, and I feel like we're giving a lot away for free in a way. Again, what can we as a community gain from this, aside from the diversity of people in more affordable housing or, or housing that's available? What other programs can we tap into and kind of use this as leverage potentially? Um, I also want to urge the community to think about who is most harmed I think we've thought a lot about who can benefit most from this, but who is most harmed with this implementation? And one group of folks that come to mind are 
town employees and people that we want to actually be able to afford to live in the town that they work in. For example, our school teachers who will have a ton of burden put on them by the um, more children that they'll have to be teaching when we have more folks joining our, our lovely town. So I'm not sure if the committee's considered how we might um, think about our town uh, employees, school teachers, and that sort of that group of people who would be critical to the backbone of a healthy community and what we might do to um, support them a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. We have Dorothy Gosline next and then Elaine Crowder. Elaine, oh yeah, I see Elaine Crowder. Dorothy Gosline, Six Wyman Terrace. Who is most harmed and what is the worst that can happen? I moved here from Seattle, Capitol Hill. They changed the district zoning 10 years ago, and all of the things that they're talking about with developers, I saw it happen in my neighborhood. That is no longer a neighborhood. The developers, I'm concerned, we're giving the developers a carte blanche. I think the committee's done a great job, but I also think the input has been very, very helpful. We, my neighborhood ended up with all different size buildings, and I just want to say, let's, open our minds, what are other options? There's an article in the New York Times a month ago in Vienna how large units are, people love living there and they stay there forever. Um, they do little apartments that are group places with small living spaces. Maybe that works for elderly people. The boomers are eventually gonna be giving up their large houses. People with young kids are gonna be moving in. I've got two grandkids in my two family. So let's really think about, you know, open our minds and not just do what we've always done and double down on, you know, multifamily housing that we've already got on the east side. Great. We have Elaine Crowder next, and then after that, Linda Hansen. Linda, still here. Oh, okay. Elaine, <clears throat> Elaine Crowder, um, Precinct 19, to Glenbrook Lane. Um, we've heard about the difficulty of public transportation that people are experiencing in Arlington and about uh, difficulties in particular getting to Alewife. We've also heard concerns about the treeless canyons that might result um, down Mass Ave um, and about the heat islands that might result without the ability to, to, to um, host uh, street trees. I'm from Arizona. I know what 110 and 115 degree pavement feels like when it hits, slaps you in the face when there's no tree or shade. Um, it seems that uh, the idea of spreading a bit beyond uh, the current map, to, I, it seems I've heard that uh, the bike path corridor has not been uh, considered for part of this. Is that correct? Claire, do you want to talk about what things have been considered? Yeah, the, um, I, not intentionally. I think that, you know, when we were, or when the working group, and I, again, I don't want to speak too much for the working group, but the, the bike path was not intentionally removed. I believe that what we were doing was focusing, uh, again, on the transportation corridors where the transit is. But point is well taken that the bike path is uh, a form of transit. Um, and, and the bike path is not only a form of transit, but it goes to Alewife. Correct. Um, right. so which is, which is, I believe, the bike path is also owned by MBTA. Is that correct? Uh, which means that it is directly within the purview of some kind of, of, a, of an MBTA uh, plan, I would think. So uh, it it seems like a good solution to begin to think in terms of spreading it a little bit away from um, a a. a six-story uh, Mass Ave corridor and, and we're, reducing a bit. Thank you. We're, for you're, the, you're at time. Thank you. Um, we have Linda Hansen and then Amy Goldstein. Amy. Hi, good evening. Linda Hansen, uh, 11 Webster Street, Precinct 9, um, Orange Zone. I want to start by thanking the committee for the work done to date and the work that you still have um, in front of you and the staff as well who've worked really hard on this. I want to start off by saying that I see um, the MBTA communities as an opportunity to increase the amount and types of housing we have in Arlington. Um, 
I think that's a good thing. And I also just want, hope that we can use this opportunity to increase um, the kind and amount of affordable housing in, in any way we can. That's actually, um, I'm very interested in that. I have a clarifying question though, um, maybe for Claire. Uh, there are two, there's blue and orange zones. Can you re just re-clarify the heights that you have um, proposed in this plan? Sure. There was like a 643 on a slide. You mentioned something about stepping down, <laughs> something about two and a half. If you could just quickly reiterate that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. I'm happy to do that. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is the Mass Ave and Broadway corridor subdistrict, which are properties with frontage on Mass Ave and Broadway. By right, allowable would be four stories with plus two stories for ground floor commercial, plus one story for affordable housing above and beyond our inclusionary zoning. So the maximum height on Mass Ave would go to six stories, maximum height on Broadway, five stories. In the neighborhood multifamily district, Properties within 350 feet of Mass Ave and Broadway, we figured that was roughly three parcels, four stories by right with a 10-foot front setback, 10 on the sides, 20 in the rear. We have not yet contemplated bonuses for neighborhood multifamily district. So in the, to be clear, in the orange zones, three, three parcels back, four stories by right. That's correct. Without any additional bonus opportunities. That's correct. And did you consider, I, I'm curious too why Miss Hanson, you're, I, I know. Two, okay. I know, yeah. two minutes is hard. Okay, I'll email it. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, next we have, it was Amy Goldstein. Okay, uh, then I have Julia Myrak. Hi, Julia Myrak, uh, 438 Mass Ave, property owner, business owner in town. Um, thank you for all the work you've done. Great ideas. Um, my only um, suggestion or request is that you do not exclude all the commercial and all the industrial. Um, by doing that, you have excluded the largest parcels in town. Um, if you want to get the density out of the neighborhoods, then allow some building on the larger parcels in, in town. Um, these are the parcels that are most attractive to a developer. A developer is not going to come in and buy three single family homes and, and build six stories. It's not going to happen. But if you have a nice big piece of land that's in a smart growth area, that's on Mass Ave or on Broadway, that's next to grocery stores, that's next to the school, that fits all your smart growth criteria, that's desirable to a developer. It'll be profitable, it'll be something that could actually get built. Um, I fear that if you leave all the commercial and the industrial zones out and leave all the large parcels out, that you may hit the letter of the law, but you won't actually get what you want, which is some serious development. Um, and so I would just encourage you to include some larger parcels of land. Thank you. Thank you. Next I have John Warden. Mr. Warden. Would, would, oh, would you like us? Okay. Thank you. Um, have you uh, heard all right? Uh, yeah, uh, John Warden. Uh, Town meeting member, Precinct 8, Jason Street. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to mention a couple of statistics. Uh, one, Arlington is the 12th densest community in the state. Not just metropolitan, in the state. We have already done our share to house people. And the, the other... 11 communities that are more dense than us of all cities except Brookline all have substantial industrial or commercial retail whatever businesses that pay taxes but don't use services we don't we have five percent in that in those categories that means all the burden of taxes falls upon the residents and the, the homeowners uh, the Statistics show that each new resident, uh, uh, on average, brings in 
half as much in new taxes as they do require for services. So we're digging a hole, and we're going to dig it deeper. I, I, I call upon the – and the third thing I'd like to say, the statute itself, read the statute, Section 3A of Chapter 40, 48. It talks about the, the half-mile zone around near a transit – adjacent to a transit station. It doesn't say anything about all these other uh, zones spread throughout the town. That is the creation of the bureaucrats in Boston who I think must be obviously deeply in bed with developers. I call upon the committee, uh, the working group, to craft a plan that follows the minimum possible compliance with the, with, with the law. Uh, with the law and, and let's talk about it. The law is one thing. The regulations, which could Mr. be tipped in court, Mr. is another. Mr. Warden, you, you reach your, your let me uh, Let me please just wrap up. Uh, all right, I call upon the committee <laughs> to craft something that, Mr. That, Warden, I, I'm sure you that, that, appreciate the difficultness of, of the job that I'm doing right now. And we, we've hit, you've hit your two minutes. Two minutes is not enough. I understand. Two minutes is a tough time. Um, well, two, minutes, to, two, two, two minutes is not enough time. I've waited for two hours to speak here. I understand. And, and I we, think you should protect the, the, the residents, we're the homeowners of Arlington. We're on to Paul Bradford, please. It's Paul the most Bradford important thing next. you should do. We're on to Paul Bradford next. <laughs> Paul Bradford? No. Um, we are very close to the end here. I appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, oh, Carol Ko We already did Car Carol Kowalski? Oh, you must have put two in. Uh, yeah. D Doug Greenfield? Uh, Amy Slutsky. Ah. And and the the winner of the uh, the the prize here is Alan Jones. <laughs> so, so the, <laughs> Alan can talk until town meeting starts. <laughs> no, Thank you to all of you. I actually watched the video of the last meeting you had, and I thought. I am so proud to live in this gorgeous, fantastic town that is progressive, thinking about sustainability, people, equity, and all of those important things. And um, I also am really thinking, oh, Amy Slutsky, I am town meeting member, um, Precinct 17, um, and I live at one Mortimer Place, the 130-unit building overlooking the Schwann Mill complex um, right on the bike trail so I appreciate that a lot so my main point I'm really sorry because I so appreciate the work that you guys have done really truly with that said I would love it if you number one reopened the survey because I'm someone who just woke up to the importance of this issue really late as you can see really late. I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. And number two, I think it would be really great to put a copy of one of the maps in a gigantic banner across Mass Ave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a member of Arlington Chapter Mothers Out Front, mm. and we are all about the climate breakdown and trying to do what we can. And number one, I love the reminder of a 15-foot setback. Every time I walk by that horrendous building, I hope no one lives here, there, <laughs> right next to Stop and Shop, I thought, what were they thinking? This is so not Arlington. Um, trees, yes, and um, protected roofs for solar panels. I don't know if we're going to have um, windmills in Arlington, but at least we can do solar panels. Um, what else did I want? Oh, uh, we've hit the, you've hit your, your two minutes. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, Alan Jones. And that is our last slip. Alan Jones, 1 Lehigh Street. And uh, I know I'm going to request that the board consider a number of things, which I know we can, probably can't require, but maybe can be incentivized. First is setbacks on the front that are larger than the 15 feet I know you're going to land on, 20, 25 feet side. Big enough for a real shade tree. I would mention that 
If you look at the butt ugly buildings next to the high school, if you pushed them back 25 feet, put a couple of big sugar maples in front of them, they'd look a whole lot better. We wouldn't have to stare at them all the time. Um, easements for public access to those 15 foot front setbacks in the form of tiny parks, maybe a bench or two, a trash can, maybe a little table, a big shade tree as a refuge for hot pedestrians and cyclists. Planning and maintenance of landscaping with, with native trees, shrubs, and other perennials, particularly if they're in one of the wildlife and pollinator cor corridors that we're, we're planning. Green parking lots with at least 50% shade tree canopy or a photovoltaic over the top and permeable pavement. Reducing the size of open parking lots using structured or underground parking inside the building footprint incentives for that. And in large projects, significantly more green space than necessary. All of these things are about uh, more natural green space, uh, managing stormwater, reducing heat islands, but possibly most important is to make sure we're not building second-class buildings so that our new neighbors don't have to live on hot, treeless, second-class streets. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of equity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to everybody for your patience this evening. It's been wonderful to hear from so many different people. Thank you to all of our panelists, to all of the staff who have uh, made this possible. Thank you to the working group members who have been working very, very, very hard. I've been proud to be the chair of this. Um, thank you. I'll allow that little bit of applause. But um, <laughs> uh, so, for folks who are watching the live stream at home or. Uh, or watching the recording later. If you want to send, share your feedback or your questions with the with the committee, MBTA communities at, oh, and I always forget, is it town.arlington.ma.us? Did I get that right? Yes, okay. Uh, that you can send your feedback to there, uh, and we will get that to the to the committee. Thank you again uh, for, uh, for a very late evening, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you.